on your own. Good afternoon. Welcome to the City Council meeting. Today is Monday, April 1st, uh, 2024. It's approximately 1 p.m. I'm Mayor Enriquez. Uh, before we start, I want to mention that we have a ASL, uh, American Sign Language Interpreter, available for every regular council meeting, and she will be at the front for anyone who requires interpretation services. Oops. Uh, we will start with a moment of silence for the brave men and women of the United States Armed Forces as they protect our interests around the globe, as well as the courageous men and women of the Las Cruces Police and Fire Department as they keep our city safe 24-7, 365. If you join us in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Yeah. Next, we have a presentation of certificates, a proclamation that uh, Mayor Pro Tem Ben Como uh, for Distracted Driving Awareness Month. Presented to Barbara Toth. Is Barbara here? Hi. Do you want to come right over here? Whereas motor vehicle collisions are the number one cause of preventable death in our nation and distracted driving is one of the fastest growing safety issues uh, on the roads today. And whereas distracted driving causes more than one million crashes each year across the US, costing the lives of more than 3,000 people an average of nine lives each day. And whereas distracted driving is a non-driving activity that takes that takes your eyes off the road, hands off the wheel, or interrupts your concentration while driving, increasing the risk of crashing, and whereas distracted drivers are the threat to everyone on the road, and that the, citizen of, the citizens of Las Cruces deserve to live in communities that promote safe driving behaviors, and whereas preventing distracted driving deaths and injuries requires the cooperation of all levels of government, of the general public, and whereas a month dedicated to programs and activities focused on reducing distracted driving will raise awareness and may result in the reduction in traffic fatalities and injuries. Now, there are, therefore, we, the Mayor and City Council of Las Cruces, New Mexico, do hereby, hereby proclaim the month of April 2024 as Distracted Driving Awareness Month. Thank you, Mayor and Council members. Thank you so much. Distracted driving is an epidemic in our country. More than eight persons every single day lose their lives because of a distracted driver. And that's absolutely unacceptable in particular because those deaths were preventable. When a driver deliberately puts the lives of others at risk, it's both irresponsible and disrespectful. And we certainly must do better. Thank you for thinking about those important things this month and beyond, I'd like to challenge each and every one of you to reevaluate your practices on the road. Decide to drive undistracted, please, every single trip. And share this message and model safe driving behaviors to everyone within your sphere of influence. Thank you. Again, thank you, Barbara. Next, we will do the recognition, recognition of the Neighborhood Leadership Academy. We can have also uh, Katrina and Grace come join us, and uh, Mayor Pro Tem will, will read um, the recognition, and I'll go down there to join as well. I'll start while you're making your way down because it's kind of long. 
In 2017, the City Council adopted a strategic plan that included the goal of greater engagement between the community and local government through establishment of its Citizens uh, Academy. This led to the establishment of the Neighborhood Leadership Academy. Come on down. The City of Las Cruces offers a Neighborhood Leadership Academy for residents who reside in the city limits. Participants receive firsthand information about city services and programs through comprehensive presentations from city personnel and on-site field trips to various public facilities. The program began in the fall of 2018 and was held each fall and spring until the spring of 2020 when the COVID-19 pandemic curtailed in-person programming. Due to great interest from the current city council and the community, the city resumed the program in the spring of 2024 with the same structure for weekly classes. The mission of the City of Las Cruces Neighborhood Leadership Academy is to provide improved knowledge of city government to residents so they can become effective neighborhood advocates and community leaders. This free program helps residents better understand how their city government operates and how they can work with the city to preserve and improve the quality of life in their neighborhoods. Through weekly workshops of presentations and scheduled field trips, participants receive firsthand information about government operations, the scope of services and programs offered by the city, and the appropriate way to bring about change within our community's neighborhoods. Some of the weekly sessions, including meeting your city administration and city councilors, electric bus demonstration and bus ride, parks and recreation activity to help build a, bar a public park, utilities demonstration of all the services utilities provides, and a codes game of, is it a violation? Both chief and police, both chief of police and chief of fire gave their, their respective departments presentations in person. The class members were very grateful and showed much respect to them. Public Works was another great department that spoke about the pavement management system and the class learned how the budget to keep streets in the green status. We would like to take this opportunity to congratulate our participants of the Neighborhood Leadership Academy. They have struck, they have stuck through 11 long weeks of presentations, demonstrations, and a lot of participation. We hope you received many takeaways from the Academy and we trust you to, will continue to work toward our common goal of improving the Las Cruces community. Thank you. And of course, a huge shout out to Katrina and Grace for leading the program. And these are the Academy graduates. I think if you want to come down and take a picture, please go ahead and do so. Maria Molina Countsman, Juan Garcia, Carolyn Hunt, Laura Jensen, Paul Mack, I hope I got that right, Joy Nelson, Marta Rodriguez, Diane Starbuck Ribaduo, Janine Townshend, Lisa Wilson, Santa Fe Zubia, Tylene Jacko, and Julia Ruiz. Give them a round of applause, everybody. Just real quick, Jen. Uh, I just want to say that uh, there was a, a graduation ceremony for them earlier at 11 o'clock where all the certificates were presented to them, and there was staff that was also there that, that provided presentations on this 10 week uh, journey that they went on to, to learn and, and to know more about the city of Las Cruces and its organization. Again, I want to thank the participants. Thank you for your time, your energy, your effort uh, to make the commitment to see it through and to graduate. So thank you. And uh, thank you to, again, Katrina and Grace for coordinating it and putting it together. So thank you. Thank you all.
Next, we have Jobs of the Week, uh, Sarah Rainey. Good afternoon. All right, for Jobs of the Week for this week, April 1st, 2024, for the City of Las Cruces, we have a scale house attendant. The position starts at 1502 and the posting closes on the 8th. We also have for the city a library manager, the support services. That position starts at 60,000 a year and the posting closes on the 22nd. <clears throat> for White Sands Missile Range, we have a systems administrator. Um, the position is posted until filled. We have for American Medical Response, an administrative assistant. That position starts at 28,000 and the posting closes on 418. We also have a Mesilla Valley Hospice um, position for a registered nurse. Posting closes on the 21st. Whoops. We have for Adelante, we have a cook and site attendant or site assistant. The position starts at 1375 an hour and the posting closes on the 19th. For these and all jobs that we have posted for the city of Las Cruces, for the Doniana area, and then throughout our region, we have all of our jobs listed on the job website. You can join us on Employee NM or come see us at the Alameda office. If you have any questions, please reach out to us. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Next, we have Pets of the Week, Amy Del Felix. Hello, everyone. I'm Amy DeFelix with the Animal Services Center of the Mesilla Valley. Um, so we can go ahead and get started. We always start off with our cat of the week. Our cat of the week this week is Madonna. Her number is 73969. And she says, I'm quiet and reserved, but I do enjoy being pet and loved on. My favorite kind of pets are neck scratches. I can't help but lean into them and start purring wildly. I'd much prefer a calm home where I can lounge and relax in. If you work from home, I can be the perfect office buddy. And then we have our dog of the week. His name is Chevy. His number is 64931. And he says, I'm a sweet and friendly boy who gets along well with other dogs and possibly even cats too if I'm given the proper introduction. I've even been proven to be a great farmer's market and picnic dog thanks to my time as a sleepover foster. I just need a loving home to give me a chance. And then for our events coming up, um, we have all, all month long, starting today until the end of April, we have our spring fleeing adoption special. All of our adoptions are only $50, so that's both altered and unaltered animals. Um, we also have an offsite adoption event at McCoy's Building Supply. This Saturday, April 6th, we will be there from 10 a.m. to 1 p.m. And then all of our website links, our, our main website, ASCMV.org, all of our social media links, we're on Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, and then our podcast is on YouTube and Spotify and Apple Podcasts as well. And that is all I have. Thank you. Thank you, Amy. Next is a conflict of interest. Does any member of city council, city manager, or any member of the city staff have any known conflict of interest with any item on the agenda? None. None, Graham. None. 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 Next is public participation. Uh, we'll allow up to three minutes, uh, as long as it's no discussion of items that are on the non-consent. And I want to make a, an announcement uh, before we start the, the public participation. Uh, I've been made aware that the New Mexico Municipal League has an evaluator that come and evaluate uh, your city council meetings. And this is a direction I want to go. I've always wanted to run a good uh, meeting, a good business meeting for for the city council and our work sessions. So I had mentioned we were gonna move the public participation to the end of the meeting. We're, we're not gonna do that now, we're gonna postpone it. I wanna get the evaluation first so that once we get the evaluation then we can look and see what moves we make. I don't wanna make numerous moves, just uh, wanting the whole intent is to try to run a good business meeting. So with that we can start on the first row on my left, or not the second row, 
Yes, sir. Go ahead. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is David Rutherford. Uh, I have a couple of issues. The first one is uh, the water issue, uh, which I think should be on, <coughs> on the top of the list. Uh, I live in Sonoma Ranch Road, and it's the Moongate Water District, I believe, right? I have that correct? I think it is, yes. So I was told <clears throat> that uh, we've got 200 years worth of water. Um, and I tried to do a deep dive, so to speak, um, on the internet to try to find out if that was accurate or not. I looked at some hydrologist reports, etc., cetera, from uh, Mexico State, and I couldn't really find anything definitive. But in my humble opinion, I think uh, water should be on top of your list because I did speak with one of my neighbors who told me that she discovered that we only have 20 years of water left. So which is it, 200 or 20 years? That's a big difference, all right? And um, I really would like to know from you and make it very transparent to the public exactly how much water is there left. That should be on the top of your list, all right? And the next meeting, or maybe in this meeting, maybe somebody could give us the answer of that, because I, I hope, hopefully I'm not the only one who's concerned about water here. Oh, sir, be. if you could speak directly to the mic. Okay, yeah, I, hopefully I'm not the only one that's concerned about water here. Um, but uh, it's, uh, yes, yes, okay. I'm not the only one. So does anybody have, an, do you have a definitive answer of how much water we have? Uh, sir, if you want to leave your name and number uh, with the clerk, and we'll make sure that the director of utilities will get to you with, with that information, and okay. then we'll do everything we can to, right. to, to get that open in public. Right, so it should be okay. open, should be transparent, yes. and we should be discussing about, because uh, you have, you're developing, you're growing, how are we going to use this water, how it's going to be allocated, how can we uh, save water, um, recharge the aquifers, et cetera, recycle the water. That's issue number, number one, top of the list. Another issue is I like cycling. I would like to be able to drive, it's not drive, excuse me. I would like to be able to take my bicycle from where I am to uh, Loman Avenue. And uh, if you looked at great, I've been all around the world, if you looked at great cities around the world, they have great public transportation and they have a great uh, roads so people can move around, walk, and cycle around. So that's another issue. Time's up. I wish I had more time, but anyways. Okay, thank you, sir. If you want to leave your name and number with the city clerk, we're, we're up, city up clerk. here on the dais. Oh, okay, thank you. No, that's the intent. Yes, sir. Still in the second row. Good afternoon. My name is Dan Parrott. I'm here on behalf of myself and my wife, Lisa Parrott. I'm also representing several families and neighbors in the high range neighborhood. We are currently requesting no changes be made to the current ordinances restricting commercial businesses in single family dwelling neighborhoods. We're also opposed to multifamily zoning retail businesses, including cannabis sales and commercial businesses in the city in our single family neighborhoods. If these type of zoning changes are approved, it's expected that the values of our homes will be reduced. Uh, I'm urging the city council to very carefully consider this uh, in relationship to the values of the homes, the future of the city, and the growth of the city for the better. Uh, thank you for your time, consideration on this request. Thank you, sir. <clears throat> Still on that second row, is there anybody? Hello. <clears throat> good, good afternoon. My name is Albert, and I'm here uh, as part of uh, Los Cruces for Palestine. I just noticed that the timer hasn't restarted. Just wanted to thank you. 
So as we gather here today, I urge us to confront the stark realities unfolding in Gaza. Since October 7th, Israel has unleashed over 25,000 tons of explosives upon Gaza. This is equivalent to the devastation levels brought on by two nuclear bombs. To put things into perspective, Gaza is 27 times smaller than Doña Ana County and holds twice the population. It is vital to recognize the disproportionate impact of violence inflicted upon its inhabitants. We're actively funding and supporting a genocidal campaign of collective punishment as Israel continues killing Palestines at unprecedented rates while bombing hospitals, ambulances, and universities, reducing them to rubble. Palestinians are dying in their homes, churches, and their shelters. As of today, most civilian infrastructure in Gaza has been flattened and rendered uninhabitable. These relentless bombings have not only claimed innocent lives, but have also shattered the pillars of Palestinian history and stifled the educational opportunities for future generations, robbing Palestinian people of their heritage. The toll on human life is equally appalling. Over 309 healthcare workers, including doctors, nurses, and ambulance drivers have been killed while serving their communities. At least 352 schools, representing over 70% of educational institutions in Gaza, have been targeted and bombarded, claiming the lives of over 200 teachers and educators. We're accountable for the future we forge ahead. I have four nieces and two nephews. Oldest one turns 15 today. When I look at them, I feel an enormous amount of responsibility. I want nothing more in the world than to be able to provide them with a safe space. I want them to know love, compassion, and unity. This aspiration is shattered when I consider the 13,000 Palestinian children who have perished in Gaza due to Israeli attacks. When I think of them, I feel an enormous amount of responsibility too. The average age in Gaza is just 18 years old. About 40% of its population consists of children 14 years old or younger. The constant fear of airstrikes, the loss of loved ones, the destruction of their homes, deliberate forced famines, and human rights violation under Israel's siege will leave psychological scars that will shape their lives and the future of their communities. We can't be complicit in creating a reality in which we turn a blind eye to these atrocities. The consequences of our inaction will echo for generations to come. Therefore, I urge this council to take a stand against the injustices being perpetrated in Gaza and demand an immediate ceasefire. It is now time to display our principles through our actions and work tirelessly towards a lasting peace that ensures the freedom, safety, and dignity of all Palestinian people. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon, city councilors. Um, my name is Devin Narvison, and I've been a resident of Las Cruces for 10 years now. And I'm here today to speak on behalf of Las Cruces for Palestine. In the last six months, at least 32,700 civilians have been killed by Israeli forces, including more than 13,000 babies and children. We know that the actual death toll is much higher given that there are more than 8,000 people currently missing under the rubble. So far, 27 people, 23 of them children, have starved to death due to the blockage of aid by Israel. This is intentional, man-made famine. When one side controls whether the other gets to eat or starve to death, it is not a conflict nor a war. It is genocide. I know that some folks in this room are thinking, why should I care? Or what does that have to do with me or the city of Las Cruces? And to that I say, you are human beings and your fellow humans are being starved and massacred and you should care about it. If this were happening to you, I'm sure that you would want people to speak up for you. I urge all of you to look within and find your humanity. Some people may think we need to focus on the issues happening here and help Americans. And to that, I have to say, I agree with you. Every single year, the US sends $3.8 billion to Israel to fund its violence against Palestinians, to steal their land, destroy their homes, and kill their people. 
That's more than 13 million of New Mexican tax dollars or $1.6 million um, of our Las Cruces tax dollars every, sorry, every single year. According to the U.S. Campaign for Palestinian Rights, that money could provide 191 Las Cruces families with public housing for a year, more than 500 children with free or low-cost health care, more than 4,500 homes with solar electricity, or even completely cancel the student loan debt for 42 Las Cruces students. So just imagine what $3.8 billion um, a year could do for communities across the country instead of funding the slaughter of innocent people. Not only as elected officials, but as human beings with a conscience, I am calling on you to use your power and your influence to call for an immediate and permanent ceasefire. It is estimated that 130 children are killed every day. More than 10 children lose a limb every day. So it's imperative that we act now. Thank you for your time, Free Palestine. Anyone else? <clears throat> Anyone else on row two? Hello, I'm Gwen Stacy, and I am also with uh, Las Cruces for Palestine. And I just want to be upfront with what we want. I'm sorry. We, what's your name again? Gwen Stacy. <clears throat> So what I want is for Las, the city of Las Cruces to support a ceasefire resolution um, for Israel and Palestine. And it is for a few reasons. The first is that, of course, there is a massive amount of civilian deaths and casualties. But in addition, there is another commonality that it has with other countries, like Ireland, China, and India, and even many tribal nations in the United States. And that is that there is an imminent danger of a famine in the region. However, in this case, it is exceptional because it is not only a famine, it is a preventable one that also includes massive amounts of violence and conflict in the area. Without a ceasefire resolution, it is very likely that lots of aid trucks will continue to be blocked in the area, that all kinds of people will be starving, almost 1.4 million civilians dying from malnutrition. And we've already seen what has been happening with um, malnourished mothers and babies being born in the area. So we, I feel that it is the responsibility of the Las Cruces City Council to join other cities in the United States in supporting a ceasefire resolution. Thank you. Hello, good day, honorable members of Las Cruces City Council. My name is Giovanni Sebastian Hernandez. I'm a 23-year-old Las Cruces, New Mexican, and child of immigrants from Mexico. And I'm also a community member organizing with Las Cruces for Palestine. I have a variety of identities, a variety of allegiances, but what matters, but what matters to me the most is our shared identity as human beings. In the spirit of our shared humanity, I believe that it is our shared right to life, to freedom, to live without fear, that are amongst the most important values that we can fight for. It is for those reasons that I humbly stand before you all today in solidarity with the people of Gaza. With our Palestinian siblings who suffer day after day, night after night from a genocidal colonial terror campaign from the state of Israel supported by the United States government. Silence and inaction is nothing more than shameful complicity with the genocidal and colonial aspirations of Israel and those of our federal government. I look at my neighbors, my fellow Las Crucians, and I cannot help but see the same faces of those being bombed, terrorized, displaced, reflected in my community. The brown eyes that look at you today are the same brown eyes that watch bombs fall on Gaza. 
Thus far, the federal government has failed to make any moves towards serious talks about a ceasefire in Gaza and has only increased sending funding, arms, and political support for the purposes of per perpetuating genocide against Palestinians. Our congressional representatives have done what they can, and now it is our turn as New Mexicans, Las Cruces, to take up the mantle, to stand on the right side of history against genocide. To that end, I urge you all, our Las Cruces City Council, to call for, pass, and stand behind a permanent ceasefire in Gaza and call on our congressional delegation to make, take further progressive action. The community has spoken and will continue to speak out against genocidal actions carried out by our federal government, by terrorist states, and against oppression. Thank you. Viva Palestina. Okay, anyone on the third row on my left? Yes, ma'am. Good afternoon, city council members and mayor. My name is Dolores Bernal, and I am the lead organizer for Save the Road Runner. Save the Road Runner is a new grassroots nonpartisan organization in Las Cruces looking out for residents and the wildlife displaced by unchecked development and construction in our city. Learn more ab about us at savetheroadrunner.org, savetheroadrunner.org. I'd like to present a short photo montage of bird species that Dana Parsons, one of our members, has observed in the 56 acres plan for the Mora Villa Dam and Apodaca Blueprint projects at Trevis and Madrid Avenues. As you can see, these desert areas are not empty. There is abundant wildlife that calls those 56 acres home. And our group is asking that you review these projects and the scale of construction that will displace the wildlife that lives there. We need environmental impact studies done for these projects and all future projects in Las Cruces. Protecting wildlife is also your mandate. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Bernal. And just for your information, Ms. Bernal did submit the video last week and it was vetted through staff and approved. Thank you. Anyone else on that row? Hello. My name is Dana Parsons. I'm a passionate birder, especially interested in the birds and wildlife found in Doniana County. I got involved with Save the Roadrunner after hearing about the plans for development at Madrid and Dravis. I am concerned with how recent development is affecting our natural habitats in Las Cruces. 
development that has already aided in displacing species like the burrowing owl, which used to be prevalent in the city and is now gone. I visited the area around Madrid and Treviz recently. Over seven days, collectively walking around 10 miles, over nine hours, I found that this area is more than what it appears. It is a very unique and diverse ecosystem. In addition to the 25 species of birds, there are mammals, reptiles, many native plants, including cacti, yuccas, trees, grasses, some only growing in water channels going through the area. There are wildflowers and native pollinators, such as bees, butterflies, and moths, which aid in the production of our natural resources. Raptors like owls and kestrels that control the local rodent population. I'm worried and concerned that the city is not taking the proper precautions to protect its natural habitats and is not aware of the unintended consequences of developing some of these areas. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else on the third row? Good afternoon. I'm Spencer Taylor, lifetime Las Cruzan, NMSU Master of Fine Arts, professor at NMSU and DACC, family visitation supervisor for Kaplan & Associates, former freelance writer for The Sun covering community events. So please know I speak to you from a perspective rooted in deep personal care and investment in our community. For over half a century, Palestinians have been marginalized, killed, displaced, and robbed in a process of a settler colonial project similar to colonization inflicted on indigenous peoples of the Americas, including in New Mexico. The colonization inflicted on Palestinians is rooted in the anti-Semitic politics of Zionism with the express goal of expelling Jews from Europe. Zionism fails to justify the illegal occupation of Palestinian lands by the state of Israel as it displaces Palestinian people in the West Bank via illegal settlements while enforcing merciless border policies on Gaza that for decades have prevented material necessities from entering Gaza and has prevented civilians from leaving. Experts call Gaza the world's largest open air prison and the world's largest concentration camp. From, over 20, from October 2023 to this minute, Israel has, with support and billions of dollars from the US, massacred civilians using modernized weaponry, bombs and drones, killing over 32,000 innocent civilians, over 12,000 children. Israel has destroyed thousands of hospitals, mosques, schools, and households while pressing roughly 1.4 million survivors into to crowded Rafa, where they face the largest catastrophic hunger in history. Palestinians have been forced to eat grass and drink boiled salt water, while injured survivors are amputated without anesthesia or basic medical care. After promising Rafa as a safe zone, Israel has killed civilians seeking refuge there. The UN has proposed three globally supported ceasefire resolutions, all vetoed by the US, despite the fact that significantly more Palestinian and Israeli hostages have been released during times of ceasefire. The International Court of Justice, led by South Africa with its own apartheid history, has convicted Israel of plausible genocide. Ignoring a confirmed UN resolution for a brief ceasefire, Israel continues to break international law with killings. These war crimes have been documented and often live streamed. Israeli and US media fail to report accurately and in full, including the proven exaggeration and fabrication of events reported by the New York Times last October 7th. What do these international events have to do with the community of Las Cruces? Beyond vital basic human empathy, a few things to consider. Billions in federal money spent on genocide as Las Cruces go without housing, health insurance, food, and education. Certainly some of this federal money could alleviate suffering in our community. What about Palestinian members of our community, students and others threatened by this normalized dehumanization, not to mention fear for their family members here in the West Bank and in Gaza? The city must serve all members of our community. A community that is only for the select is no community at all. Let us take a moral stance in history. I call on the city to stand for a permanent ceasefire in Gaza and the West Bank, restoration of funding to UNRWA, which provides vital humanitarian aid, free passage of humanitarian aid to Gaza, and commitment to reparations for the Palestinian people. Thank you for your time. Good afternoon, Council. My name is Jorge Aguirre. I'm a small business owner and employer and resident of Las Cruces. And I'm here because bringing back the topic to local issues. So, of course, we I also support the, like we should pronounce, I guess, our city against genocide. But anyway, I'm here because a lot of the issues facing our, 
our community are caused by poverty. And poverty doesn't happen in a vacuum, right? It's created by artificial uh, scarcity. Uh, and it causes desperation. And it often leads to violence and crime and theft, right? So supporting the police, I support the police too, but we also supporting the police means understanding their limitations. Uh, and they cannot, even with the best of budgets, uh, solve the root issues of the problem, which again is poverty. So how is the city promoting poverty? Uh, well, we deserve a city built for citizens and not for cars. Cars are machines of poverty. So this is why I would like to request the removal of building setbacks and parking minimums from the city code. Legalize housing. Asphalt is expensive, and requiring it arbitrarily increases the cost of doing business in the city and the cost of street maintenance in the city's budget. A city designed for cars encourages driving even for the smallest of distances. Wider roads and plentiful free parking encourage demand for vehicles, which increases traffic, which increases more demand for wider roads, which increases the cost for everybody in a cycle of ever increasing cost but not solving the problem. The problem of transportation for our citizens. Parking lots are free, but we are paying for the free parking lot and have that free avenues with the isolation of our communities. Even people who shouldn't drive are forced behind the wheel because there are no safe and practical alternatives. A city designed for cars also restricts the freedom and growth of our youth. It renders them unable to move about the city without an adult driving them around, effectively supervising them like children, limiting their independence unless their parents can afford to pay double their cost of insurance. This is why I would like to request again the removal of requirements for building setback and parking minimums from the city of Las Cruces. Free our investors and business owners to adapt their new buildings in the way that makes the most sense so they can build whatever meets the demands of their customers instead of the need to adhere to a city ordinance. Thank you. Good afternoon, Council, uh, Mayor. Uh, my name is Israel Chavez. I'm a civil rights attorney here in uh, our fair city. A um, couple of things, I, I'm very proud of the group that's come out. I, I would uh, assert to the council and to the mayor that probably the majority of our community, at least in my experience, believes everything you're hearing. Um, while my name is Israel, I'm, my namesake is not the country, and I don't support uh, what's happening in the Middle East. And I do think that all politics are local, and we all have a role to play in the betterment of the world. If you don't believe that, you wouldn't be sitting on this dais. And if you are sitting on this dais, then you also have a role to play in condemning what's happening in the Middle East. Um, I want to uh, mention that narrowing Loman and Amador was a conversation we had. We were promised we were going to make it more walkable as a city. Uh, there's been crickets since uh, the recent election, and so I would call on uh, the mayor and council to bring that back up. Another person has died again at Loman and Amador. Um, I don't want it to be one of us, and so please, please, please make it more walkable. Please make it accessible. Um, I also want to address, uh, in my office, I've gotten quite a few more um, civil rights uh, issues from the city. Uh, I know Attorney Samples has probably seen my name a couple more times more recently. I'm, I want to, in no uh, uncertain terms, condemn the uh, anti-people, anti-struggling people sentiment that seems to be uh, uh, emanating from certain levels of the city. Um, we should be anti-homelessness. We should want to get people housed. We should not be anti-people. And that's what I'm seeing. I'm seeing contractors of the city, that security force that you pay for downtown, I'm seeing really egregious conduct. I'm seeing mistreatment of people who are perceived to be homeless. And look, I, I live here. I don't want the city to have to pay through all these lawsuits, but I have no, I, make me unemployed, please fix the problem. Uh, lastly, I want to condemn the expensive private studies that the city continues to pay, like the lights in the Mesquite District. Now we have to pay a half a million dollar study to put in lights? Come on, it's a waste of money. You have so many staff internal, and, you, and, and previously, and I say you, it's sort of the royal you, nobody in particular, um, the city had said that they were going to use internal people, and now again we get told, oh well, it's going to cost a half a million, we only have like 600 grand for lights. And I don't know who these out-of-state folks are who keep getting paid so much money, but you can ask the community and the community will tell you where the lights need to be. We walk the streets, we get harassed by folks and city employees sometimes, 
in the streets of our own community. We'll tell you where the problems are. Just listen and do not move public comment to the end of city, co- city council because that seems to me that it, it shows what the city thinks about public comment. So I appreciate all your work immensely. I'm happy to t- meet with any of you whenever you'd like. My office is just across the street. Anyone on the fourth row? Good afternoon, Mayor and City Councilors. My name is V. Quevedo. I'm a resident of Las Cruces in District 1. When I was thinking of what I should say today, what would be the best thing to say, I decided um, that nothing would be more important than what Palestinians are saying. I'm here with Las Cruces for Palestine to ask our City Council for a ceasefire in Gaza. So I'm going to use my time to quote Palestinian attorney Lara Alborno's words from a December 13th interview when asked what was the worst day. Quote, every day has been the worst day. Israel outdoes itself in brutality and destruction every day. So every day is the worst day. The day that Yoav Gallant called Palestinians human animals and announced that we would be denied food, water, fuel, and electricity was the worst day. The day Israeli officials announced that they were rolling out the Gaza Nakba was the worst day. The days Israel sieged and raided Al-Shifa Hospital, bombed the maternity ward, and bombed the outside clinic was the worst day. The days that media outlets confirmed one by one that Israel was lying about Al-Shifa's hospital, but it was too late because the damage was already done, those were also the worst days. The day Israel dropped six one-ton bombs on the Jebelia refugee camp, killing hundreds of civilians, was the worst day. Every day has been the worst day because every day is the worst day for families in Gaza, and we are, as a community, every day grieving every act of brutality as an act on us and our families. The stated aim time and again has been nothing short of genocide and therefore the target is Palestinian life itself. So every day has been the worst day. Now in the months since she gave that interview, we reached a day where the number of children killed by Israel in Gaza passed 10,000 children. And that also belongs on the list for the worst day and yesterday, Israel ended another two-week siege on Al-Shifa Hospital, which constitutes 30% of the health care in Gaza, killing over 300 patients, doctors, nurses, refugees, children. So yesterday was also the worst day. I'm also here to provide additional signatures to our ceasefire petition. On March 4th, Las Cruces for Palestine delivered 352 signatures to this council. Today we have an additional 56 from Las Cruces residents who I can turn into the clerk. The text of our petition mirrors the asks and resolutions passed in over 50 U.S. cities. We're asking to bring the United States into compliance with international law and basic human decency. As of day 178 of this genocide, Israel has killed, as you've already heard, over 32,000 Palestinians, including 13,000 children, has injured another 76,000 Palestinians, and has kidnapped, tortured, and is still imprisoning over 7,000 Palestinians. We here in the United States have a responsibility to do everything we can to stop this. Thank you. Um, Good afternoon, Council and Mayor. My name is Abigail Saluxagon, and I currently reside in Las Cruces. As a future counselor, one of the most important foundations in the counseling profession is advocacy. So that means advocating for the marginalized and the oppressed, advocating for those whose voices are either not being heard or just being ignored, and advocating for those who are not able to advocate for themselves. So with that being said, I am here today solely to advocate and amplify the voices of Palestinians and demand a permanent ceasefire on Gaza now. As you may know, Ramadan began and Lent continued throughout March a holy month that provides opportunities for self-discipline, spiritual growth, reflection, fasting, prayer, and community, and doing so while being in the presence of friends and family. Well, all that seems to be pretty limited and challenging for Palestinians observing the month of Ramadan and Lent right now because they are currently going through a genocide Israel is committing. More than 1.4 million Gazans are currently um, displaced in Rafah, now the most densely populated area on earth. They were forced to leave their communities, homes, and lands disrupting their culture, livelihood, stripping off their identity. The act of displacement on Palestinians have been ongoing for 75 years. 
we are witnessing a repeat of the Nakba 1948, which killed around 15,000 Palestinians and displaced more than 750,000. Nearly 200 heritage, heritage um, sites, including mosques, Christian and Catholic churches, have either been destroyed or damaged 100 days in the genocide. And according to the United Nations um, Children's Fund, they have estimated that at least 17,000 children in Gaza are either um, un unaccompanied or separated from their parents. So let me ask you this. How are Palestinian children, parents, and families able to enjoy this holy month without each other and their community? How are they able to reflect and increase spiritual growth next to the rubbles of what was once their home, where the smell of death linger in the streets, reminding them of how long the genocide has been going on? How are they able to break their fast due to the limitation of aid entering safely into Gaza? How are they supposed to persist in self-discipline without having any rest for six months? How are they able to spend extra time reading the Quran or the Bible and perform special prayers when they're anticipating on when the next bomb is going to occur? Bombs that have been and are currently being funded by the US. Bombs that have killed more than 32,000 Palestinians. That's two-fifths of the population here in Las Cruces. Those were people with families, friends, and aspirations who deserve a future, who deserve to go home after a long day, complain about their day, watch the sunset with their loved ones, who deserve to enjoy the simple pleasures in life just like us. We need to act now. 77 Palestinians have been murdered and 108 injured just on Easter Sunday. This nation under God has sent billions of dollars to murder our Christian and Muslim brothers and sisters. As challenging and thought provoking to hear these questions and statements, they must not run our morals obsolete. We have to embrace the responsibility of collective care and respect for the value of human life, dignity, and equality, and that our empathy and compassion remain guiding principles of our decisions, but we need to act now. All right, thank you. Good afternoon, all. My name is Anna Chi, and I'm here as part of the group Las Cruces for Palestine. You all are sitting here right now after a night of rest in your own warm beds. You might have even had breakfast or lunch. Multitudes of people and families in occupied Palestine are not so lucky. A huge part of the city you represent is a community serving institution, New Mexico State University, which has many locations throughout our state. It is an integral part of our life here. I'll remind you now that NMSU is a minority serving institution in our land of enchantment. Please show your humanity by voting to pass an immediate and permanent ceasefire resolution on behalf of our wonderful city. Do you stand against genocide? Do you support the minorities in your community, both local and global? I urge you to take a firm stance against the brutal terrorism and genocide perpetuated by the terror state of Israel on innocent Palestinian lives for what has now been generations upon generations. Look inside yourselves, inside of your souls, as people who share this earth with other human beings. Please pass an immediate and permanent ceasefire resolution on behalf of our city. Be on the right side of history. Viva Palestina. Thank you. Um, I believe we're still on row four. Okay, row five. Row six. Row seven. Come on down. You know the drill. Mayor, excuse me, Mayor, Council, Juan Garcia. For the record, I do support Israel and the Israeli people who suffered a brutal attack on 7 October. <clears throat> My comments here today are about inducting the little shop on Main into the Las Cruces Hall of Shame, a list of forgotten victims of the Las Cruces criminal element. Patricia is the owner of the small shop on Main, latest casualty. This small business started about four years ago with a spark of hope of living the American dream. Patricia, like many other forgotten victims, wanted to support the community and make a decent living through hard work and commitment to her customers. No handouts. Patricia, like many others, borrowed or saved every penny to invest in their dream, only to see their dreams go up in smoke. 
Many wanted a business downtown in the pride of Las Cruces. The small shop was a thriving business, specializing in Southwest clothing, furniture, and jewelry. Did inflation close the business? No. Mismanagement? No. About two years ago, the drugs and crime started to increase. Vagrants breaking windows in her shop, smoking crack, doing drugs in front of her store. But you know this, she came and pleaded for your help, like dozens, perhaps hundreds of others. Some closed and others continue enduring the criminal element, like the Oregon Mountain Outfitters, who just scored their fifth break-in this weekend. The thousands upon thousands upon thousands of dollars in losses, sleepless nights, stress from vagrants, striking over and over, door locked for her safety in broad daylight was too much. The vagrants stood in front of her main window and spit, phlegm, and who knows what else. Dried and gross, it looks like yellow oatmeal stuck to the windows. They knew nothing would happen to them. Why? Because they can. This is what the, this is what the building looks like. It's an empty building, soon to have a new business and the same place. This is the former little shop. So whose fault is it? The council? No. You guys have done all they can do. LCPD? No. They can only enforce the laws on the books. Our state elected officials who are coming up for re-election, the same ones who never raise a finger to help because if an issue is not a priority, like banning plastic bags or providing free tax dollars to pregnant people? No, the fault lies at the feet of every one of us. Doña Ana citizens continue to elect state officials who are not interested in public safety. So the question remains, Cuanto más? How much longer are we going to take this? Thank you. Anyone else on the seventh row? On the eighth. Mayor, my name is Diane Williams. I'm here regarding the um, proposed um, change in the zoning for the Banmore Estates, I think it's called. On okay, ma'am, uh, you can have public comments when we get to that item. Oh, okay, you, I'm sorry. Okay, thank you. Yeah, go ahead. Kudos to Cassie McClure. Um, she's not, I'm not in her district but I stumbled across her on Facebook and really appreciate your efforts to inform the citizens and help us understand the complexities of how the city works. No, right, thank you. So I think that was the eighth row. Anyone else on the eighth row? Uh, ninth row? Anyone else on the left side? Okay, moving to the right side. Anyone on the first row? Good afternoon, Mr. Mayor, um, City Councilors. My name is Donald Wilson. Uh, my first comments today are as a member of the Vulnerable Road Users of New Mexico. You met Barbara Toth earlier when you um, announced the proclamation for Distracted Driver Awareness Month. I would just like to add to her comments that our website, which is uh, www.vrunm.org, has a place for every citizen in Las Cruces to take a distracted driver, um, a non-distracted driver pledge. Offers you the opportunity to commit to focusing on driving when you're behind the wheels of a motor vehicle so that the other road users in our city can be safe. Uh, next, I'd like to address you as president of Velo Crucis. Velo Crucis is a local bicycle advocacy organization. You've already heard from a couple of citizens today about their interest in making sure the roads in Las Cruces are safe for all users. And I would like to reiterate once again the request from Velo Crucis that the city of Las Cruces join 
many nations, many states, many cities in adopting a Vision Zero pledge. The idea of a Vision Zero pledge is that the city of Las Cruces would use its resources and its efforts in designing roadways to make sure that all road users are safe with the goal of eliminating road user deaths within 10 years. Velocruces is ready to stand with the city and be a part of the city in making this effort come to fruition so that everybody that lives in Las Cruces that needs to move about the city can do so safely. Once again, we ask you to uh, take up the challenge, uh, accept the Vision Zero challenge, and then let Velocruces be a part of the solution for the city of Las Cruces. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you. That was the second row. Anybody else on the second? Okay, on the third row on the right. My name is Blaze Gunderson. I have lived here my whole life, and so have my parents. Um, I've heard many citizens speaking of how they have had issues with the homeless and are told by sitting employees to have compassion. Does the city or the council have compassion for these people? I don't believe you do. Council showed that when they did not care when on June 21st of 2021, James Garcia's head was cut off in one of our most popular parks. What was the council and city's response? Nothing. A man's head was cut off and nothing has changed. It's only gotten worse. This is what has created the environment that led to the killing of Officer Hernandez. When Officer Hernandez was killed, I cannot think of one person that was surprised, and we all knew we were heading in this direction, and everyone could see it. I work in section four between the community of Hope and the bus, the bus terminals. All day, me and my coworkers are subjected to threats of violence and fear of harm. I hear homeless people screaming as they walk past our place of work, screaming threats about other people or someone that is not there. Most recently, a homeless man walked around our property three times and threatened us with an electric drill. Months ago, another man stripped naked and threatened to rape our office manager, and he went into great detail. The cops arrived, and all they could do was have him redress and told him to leave. But of course, he came back and stripped again. When I say homeless, what comes to mind? When I and others in this community come here and speak of the homeless people here in Las Cruces, we are speaking of the lost souls you see, barely able to hold themselves up, sleeping on concrete, arguing with someone that is not there. These lost souls, being homeless, is a symptom of a far deeper situation that they find themselves in. These people need a lot of help. Drug rehabilitation, mental health in intervention, and in some cases, they need to be placed in a care facility as they are unable to take care of themselves. Does the city have the ability to help these lost souls? No, we don't. And I don't think you have a plan on helping them. If you really want to change and help these lost souls you're encouraging to live here, reopen the Doñana Crisis Center, make it open a rehabilitation center, a rehab, anything. What is the council's goal? There was a huge project to revitalize downtown. For what? A Visit Las Cruces building was put downtown. For what? We have been told that these people visit for sporting events and they told they look around and they do not want to return. The city should be embarrassed and ashamed. Local businesses have been coming in here and asking for help with this situation and you consider it a personal attack. If you think chain businesses would like to build here, then why they'll know they'll be broken into and vandalized and their employees threatened? Why would they want to be here either? What do you consider to be worse? A man's head getting cut off, an officer being killed. When do you consider this a problem and that it needs to be fixed? Okay, that was the third row. Anyone else? The fourth row. Good afternoon, city council, city managers. My name is Jack Ekman. I am here today to ask for some assistance. The last meeting of the Oversight Committee of the City of Las Cruces was held on September 20th. 
of 2023. So we have missed meetings in October, November, December of 2023, January, February, and March of 2024. And I have a stake in the ordinance, the accountability and govern, government ordinance, uh, number 2881. Uh, we're in default of that ordinance at this time. I'd appreciate your assistance. I'm the only voting member left, and I have not resigned. I don't know if I've been removed or not, but I have not resigned. We need two more voting members. I understand two non-voting members have been appointed by this council, two city councilors. And so I very much am just looking for communication. I'm just looking for what is going to happen next or what are the thoughts, the policy thoughts of city council on this. As you direct the policies of the city and the ordinance being one of those, I have to assume that uh, you'll, you're doing something about this or you're about to do something about this. We need a voting member from the law community and one from the accounting audit committee. Uh, on September 20th, two of our voting members resigned for different reasons. And I am very much looking for direction and what you would have me do, because I stand also as a servant of the city. Thank you so much. Thank you, sir. Anyone else on that row? Hello, my name is Dylan Davis. Um, I am a mother of three beautiful children, two of which are twins. My twins were born at 29 weeks gestation and weighed only two pounds at birth. I'm not sure how many of you have witnessed the fragility of a premature baby, but it cannot be overstated. Preemies require very special care, a specific temperature provided by incubators, feeding tubes, and an oxygen supply. In November of 2023, there were 36 premature babies trapped inside of Al-Shifa Hospital NICU inside of Gaza. Due to Israel cutting off water and electricity to this hospital, medical staff were forced to leave behind their patients including these 36 premature babies, to die. If this is a war, what crime did these innocent babies commit to deserve such a slow, painful, and lonely death? Early this morning, Israeli troops withdrew from the same hospital after two weeks of total siege. What they left behind is a scene of utter horror and devastation. The few living journalists that remain in Gaza are reporting a gruesome nightmare that is their reality. Israeli forces executed 300 people, including doctors, surgeons, and patients at this hospital. Hundreds of bodies surround the medical complex, many of their hands and legs tied behind their backs, completely flattened by a bulldozer. Every single square inch of the hospital, which was older than the state of Israel and once constituted 30% of the healthcare system in Gaza, is completely torched and destroyed, including the bodies of these 36 premature babies. The damages are irreparable, and the complex, along with all of its equipment, will need to be rebuilt from scratch. There is no need for this level of a devastation, and it is almost completely funded by American taxpayer dollars. New Mexico is one of the 33 states that have cooperative agreements with Israel. In the last few months alone, the U.S. has spent $18 billion to fund Israel's genocide against the people of Palestine. I would like to request the representatives of our city to introduce a resolution calling for an immediate and permanent ceasefire and an end to the mass destruction in Palestine. Our resolution, along with the resolutions introduced by cities and towns across the country, has the capability of making a real tangible difference and saving countless innocent lives. Thank you for your time. Uh, <clears throat> next would be row five. Anyone on row five? Good afternoon all, my name is Elizabeth Bennett. I am an alumni of the Public Health Social Work Program at NMSU and a proud member of Las Cruces community. Even though we are a big little town tucked away in the dusty desert of New Mexico, we have made history in a lot of meaningful ways. 
not afraid to do the right thing even when it's unpopular or unheard of in other parts of the state or nation. As a local community, we are strong, and as a global community, we are mighty. Today, I want to challenge you to continue to show courage and join the other U.S. cities and international officials who have called for an immediate and permanent ceasefire in Gaza. The horror of the indiscriminate, wrathful slaughter of the innocent and holy people of Gaza has echoed across the globe. A nation's cries for help reverberate through the deafening silence of the world where the rest of us sit and watch, unmoved to lift a hand in their defense, some of us going as far to deliberately turn away or regulate and sanction others into not talking about it. If you aren't already disturbed by the relentless death and destruction, I implore you to look beyond the sanitized stories of the mainstream media or the official reports of the IDF press office, but rather have the courage to bear witness to the hours and hours of unfiltered footage of a smoldering nation that is being live streamed from people on the ground in Gaza. If you are telling yourself that the problem is too far away and none of our business, you don't have to look any further than the U.S.-Mexico border to see the impact of state and federal partnerships with the Israeli government to develop, test, and deploy border weaponry and surveillance technologies, such as the Hermes drones and integrated fixed tower systems, which are currently being used to deter migrants from seeking refuge in the U.S. Palestine is a hub for battle testing the tools used in the escalating militarization of American cities and borders. To stay silent as the Israeli government unleashes its genocidal rampage across Palestine is to allow for a new global precedent of oppression in the form of mass murder, displacement, maiming, starvation, and land theft. Is that the world you hope to create as counselors? I'm here today to urge you all who I respect as a wise and impactful body to join in calling for an immediate and permanent ceasefire and to end all U.S. aid to Israel, who have clearly demonstrated their disdain for Palestinian life and land. As a body that claims to represent your community for the purpose of maintaining its safety and well-being, please do what you can to stand for the humanity of our local and global communities. Free Palestine. Anyone else on that row? And the uh, sixth row? My name is Fred Huff, and I want to express my gratitude for the public comment time not being moved to the end of your business meeting. I respect the mayor's reasoning for the idea of moving the public comments to the end of the business meeting when he noticed that almost everyone left after the public comment period. He felt that the counselors did not have an opportunity to address some of the public concerns. Unfortunately, with the current format, the public and the counselors are just talking at each other and not to each other regardless of when the public or the counselors speak. Maybe the counselors could address the public concerns immediately after the public comment time and before your business meeting, um, or have a fixed time set later in the council meeting for public comments. This is why we are asking for a work session with the city council to better address some of the very important issues of crime vandalism, car theft, and vagrancy that are affecting our quality of life. One very easy and noticeable step to restoring our quality of life would be to pass a grocery cart ordinance that gives the city authority to remove this litter from our streets. Maybe this ordinance could even have the ability to arrest and charge the thieves that are removing these carts from the business properties. Another very noticeable improvement to our quality, quality of life would be for us to be able to drive the streets and not be accosted at every major intersection and store parking lot by people asking for money. This last weekend at the intersection of Walmart and Walnut, 
an organized group was walking within the traffic lanes soliciting donations, regardless of the traffic light colors. I am very surprised that one of them did not get hit or cause an accident. I have actually asked my wife not to go to any of the stores in the area of Walmart and Best Buy on Loman by herself because of all the panhandlers walking around in the parking lots. Please support any ordinances addressing these issues when they are presented to you. Myself and a whole lot of other people want to work together with you to help solve these issues. Thank you. Good afternoon, Mayor and Council. I'll be brief today. In fact, I was going to say I only had eight seconds left. No, if you could just state your name for the record. Henry Young. I'll be brief today. I am in the process of putting together a comprehensive report and presentation showing a beginning that we could use in our city to overcome the crime, homelessness, address the entire package because it has worked in other places with some tweaks that we could use in our own city. And I would be ready if we, when we have a task force assigned to that to make a presentation to council or anyone that wants to listen. And I'd be glad to do that. We need to all work together. We can only do so much within our own confines, whether that be the city as a whole, <clears throat> me at the Mission Community of Hope. It is imperative that we do work together to overcome the problems that are facing us as a community. But I hope that maybe what I am putting together can be a beginning so that we can then work from that and find a compromise and the money to fund it. Thank you. Anyone else there on the sixth, uh, seventh row? Thank you, city councilors and mayor. I'm Sarah Smith. Thank you, Mayor Enriquez, for keeping the public comment at the beginning of the meetings. Councilors McClure and Flores have expressed support for having a legislative team that would more effectively advocate for the needs of our community with the legislature. When we concerned citizens of our community contact our local Las Cruces senators and representatives, we rarely get any response. I hope that you will move forward with creating this legislative team since your voices as an elected body could be so much more powerful in advocating for what we need. I presume there is probably more happening behind the scenes than I can see, but in case you don't know, Las Cruces Public Schools takes an active role in advocating for their specific needs with the legislature. Maybe it would be helpful for the city council to model the legislative team on their experience. For instance, Las Cruces Public Schools has a legislative forum where they meet with legislators to discuss what is needed. They also participate in the interim committee meetings of the legislature. Those committee meetings will be starting on July 17th this year in preparation for the 2025 legislative session. From monitoring the bills proposed during the last couple legislative sessions, there were quite a few that had the potential to help our crime situation in Las Cruces. Our Las Cruces representatives and senators generally voted against these bills, but maybe if you show support for them, things could be different. I'm going to follow up with an email to all of you as well as Chief Story with a list of some of the bills you might be interested in advocating for in the next session. These include bills that you have mentioned supporting already, such as changing the bail reform laws and addressing incompetency so that we can stop the catch and release of many repeat offenders in Las Cruces. But there are also other bills that you may want to look at, including ones that would fortify the three strikes law, increase penalties for felons in possession of firearms, as well as trafficking drugs in possession of a firearm, Increase the penalties for organized residential theft, attacks on law enforcement, shoplifting, fentanyl-related crimes, and additional violent felonies. 
You may have heard that Oregon is backtracking on their legalization of drug possession. One thing they are going to implement is the option for drug treatment instead of jail time, and that seems to be in alignment with the approach that you are wanting to take here in Las Cruces for some offenses. Maybe that is something you would want to advocate for in some of the state laws as well. We can work together on this. If you are able to get momentum building for these crime bills in the legislature, then we can potentially help by mobilizing the people of Las Cruces and our statewide grassroots network to show mass support for the bills as well in order to increase the, pan the chance that they will pass in the legislature. Thank you. Anyone on the eighth row? Ninth? Anyone else? Okay, thank you. Thank you all. Next is to read the closed um, meeting statements that took place on March 18th and March 20th. So Las Cruces City Council met in closed session at 11 a.m. March 18, 2024. The following members were in attendance. Mayor Enriquez was via Teams, uh, Councilor McClure, Councilor Matisse, Councilor Graham, Mayor Pro Tem Bencomo, Councilor Coran, Councilor Flores. Uh, staff were present were Joe Richards and J.C. Borrego from Human Resources. The meeting adjourned at 12.43. Uh, Mayor Enriquez left at 12.19. A statement for the record. The Las Cruces City Council met in closed session and only discussed those limited items as stated in the posted notice. The purpose of the closed meeting is to discuss the limited personnel matters regarding the hiring of the city manager, which is closed pursuant to NMSA 1978 section 1015-1H. Two. On March 20th, the Las Cruces City Council met in closed session at 10.49 a.m. on March 20th. The following members were in attendance. Mayor Enriquez, Councilor McClure, Councilor Matisse uh, arrived at 10.54 and left at 5.02 p.m. Uh, Councilor Graham, Counts, uh, Mayor Pro Tem Bencomo, Councilor Coran, Councilor Flores. Staff, uh, Joe Richards, HR Director. Joe left at 11.03. J.C. Borrego, HR Deputy Director. Linda Samples, our City Attorney. David Cedillos, Public Work Director, entered at 11.04 and left at 11.47. Sonia Delgado, Assistant City Manager, at, entered at 12.58 p.m. and left at 1.38 p.m. Ikani Tamopayao, entered at 2.36 p.m. and left at 3.30 p.m. The meeting adjourned at 5.18 p.m. Statement for the record, the Las Cruces City Council met in closed session and only discussed those limited items as stated in the posted notice. The purpose of the closed meeting is to discuss limited personnel matters regarding the hiring of the city manager, which is closed pursuant to NMSA 1978, section 1015-1H2. Next, uh, the acceptance of agenda. Move to approve, Corin. Second by Flores. This is on the motion to accept the agenda as presented. Councilor McClure? Yes. Councilor Matisse? Yes. Councilor Graham? Yes. Councilor Cran? Yes. Councilor Flores? Yes. Councilor Bencomo? Yes. Mayor? Yes. Next is section eight, resolutions and or ordinance for discussion. 8.1, resolution number 24-100, a resolution approving an employment agreement for Econi Tamopayao as city manager. Move to approve. Second by Flores. 
uh, to present will be the Deputy Director of HR, J.C. Borrego. Good afternoon, Mayor, Mayor Pro Tem, and Council. My name is J.C. Borrego, Assistant Director of Human Resources for the record. Um, in front of you, Resolution 24-100 is City Manager Appointment and Employment Contract. Employment contract. Uh, as you're aware, Article 3, Section 3.01A through C of the City Charter provides that the City Council has the authority to appoint a, a City Manager. On March 18th, 2024, in a closed session, the City Council discussed the internal hiring process and reviewed the applicants to interview. Um, that, that meeting was noticed and published. Um, there were nine candidates that applied. Um, three candidates were selected for interview at that time. On March 20th, 2024, City Council interviewed th those three candidates in a closed session. Um, which was also uh, published and noticed. Um, and the city council's uh, candidate, top candidate was Ikani Tompeo. The employment agreement, the three-year employment agreement provides for a base salary of $216,000 annually, a $500 vehicle allowance monthly, access to city health care benefits, medical, dental, and vision, et cetera, those are the same benefits that all city employees have access to. Um, a two-week paid vacation, 16 hours of personal leave, uh, 160 hours of annual leave to be accrued annually, 96 hours of sick leave to be accrued annually, and the city manager must contribute to PARA. Um, those are the monetary um, provisions within the, the contract. There are other terms and conditions within that contract, which I'm sure you've all read thoroughly. Um, and with that, the options uh, for council are to vote yes to approve, vote no to deny, vote to amend, or vote to table. I stand for questions. Any questions from council? Okay. I just wanted to have a comment since we have almost a full house here today. Um, I just want to note that the city manager position is 24-7. It is not a job that you get to clock out at 5 p.m. or 6.30 or 6 p.m. It is 24-7. And so folks might look at it and say, wow, that salary or wow, those benefits. But honestly, it's because this job is incredibly difficult. Um, in this, especially in a council manager form of government, um, the city manager's position is vital to the success of our city. And um, I just want to note that. I think those, those two weeks are actually mandatory time off because we need a city manager who is, who is taking care of their own mental and emotional health um, as well as taking care of the city, the entire city. And so I just want to point that out before we move forward because um, this is no small decision, it's no small position. And I, I just wanted to make those notes before um, we move forward to a vote. Okay, thank you, Mayor Pro Tem. I was gonna ask if there's any members of the public that had any comments. Okay, thank you, Christine. This is on the motion to approve resolution 24-100. Councilor McClure? No. Councilor Matisse? Yes. Councilor Graham? Yes. Councilor Coran? Yes. Councilor Flotis? Yes. Councilor Bencomo? Enthusiastically, yes. And Mayor? Yes. Motion passes. Congratulations. 
Yes, congratulations, E. Connie. And uh, yeah, at this time, uh, I'd like to turn it over to E. Connie if he wants to say a few words. Thank you, Mayor Enriquez, Mayor Pro Tempe and Como, and to all the city councilors, thank you so much. Um, I am, am humbled, I am blessed and honored uh, to have been selected and thank you for your support. Um, I just want to uh, say also to um, Councillor McClure, um, I, I, I appreciate her and I, I respect that and I appreciate her uh, pulling me off to the side in the beginning as she shared um, the, as she shared what she was going to do with the vote and I really uh, appreciate you doing that and I have nothing but respect for you because you, you did that and I promise all of you uh, that I will give you each 120% uh, of myself. Um, and that's, I can do that because there is a staff of 1,700 uh, qualified, intelligent um, staff that will give the shirt off their back ready to impress, uh, impress you. This is a position that is not easy, um, but it's, it's possible because of the staff that are here of this organization. I just want to share, um, it, it takes courage to go internal uh, in the recruitment for, for how important uh, this position is. But the confidence that you had in staff, for the belief that you had in staff to go internal, uh, speaks to how qualified a staff we have in here. Uh, it's not an easy decision, but uh, the same confidence you have is the same confidence I have uh, in the staff. And that's why I know uh, I can do uh, this job because of them. And I just wanted to, to share that. Um, you mentioned the, the salary, um, my commitment to you that I, um, I will be worth that and more, honestly. Um, if there, um, and I, I will let action speak for itself. Uh, again, staff, they do the heavy lifting and um, and that's all I'll, I'll say with that. Lastly, I'll share this. Um, I'm a sports person, as many of you in this room are, um, and I, I was thinking of something to share and to end with you, and something that has kept me going throughout life. Um, I've had coaches probably shared with you all that before you go into the game, they try to give you an inspiration and they try to lift your spirits up. And the coaches, uh, when they have shared several times, has resonated me. Uh, resonated with me throughout this time and it's it's leave it all on the field don't leave anything left in the tank that when that quarter or that round or that set or that half is done at the end of the game that they're going to have to carry you off the field and I promise you Mayor Enriquez, Mayor Pro Tem, Ben Coleman, City Councilors that they're going to have to carry me off the field I'll give it I'll give you 120 um, percent that's my commitment to you um, city councilors, that's my commitment to staff, and that's my commitment to the community. Uh, whatever you need, my door is always open. And if you catch me in the street or, or, or wherever I am, I, along with staff, we're here to serve you all. Thank you. Thank you, city manager. Now, uh, 8.2, resolution number 24-101, a resolution approving the Quality of Life Department, 2024-2025 fees, schedules, and charges, and repealing resolution 16-244, 19-0118, and 20-041. Move to approve, Graham. Second, Corin. Presenting will be Quality of Life Director, Carol Bray. Good afternoon, Mayor and Council. Carol Bray, Director of the Quality of Life Department. And it's my pleasure to present to you this afternoon the Quality of Life Department fees and charges for the remainder of this fiscal year as well as uh, fiscal year 2025. So we do an annual review of our department's fees and charges, our advisory boards, and we have two, the Library Advisory Board and Senior Programs Advisory Board, review those fees and charges, and uh, they have uh, recommended this action as well. 
Uh, we look at fees and charges that are equitable and at fair market value. And our um, intent is to make sure that we make our facilities as accessible and open to everyone as possible here in the city of Las Cruces. I'm going to go through each line of business very quickly just to give you a couple of highlights uh, for the fees and charges from each uh, line of business. So first with senior programs, uh, we offer recreation classes for seniors and we're increasing that number. We offer, you can see, a variety of, of uh, programs from arts and crafts to, to uh, social recreation activities. Those are our dances and other activities recreation classes in general, such as Zumba Gold, which is one of our newest ones. And uh, sometimes kits are extra, so if you're doing a jewelry class, that is, uh, might be a $50 kit. But in general, as you can see, they're very reasonably priced. And the reason there's a range here is it has to do with the kind of class they're taking, uh, how much we pay the instructor, and how much the materials cost. We basically just try to recoup our costs. I did want to note also that we charge uh, for congregate meals for guests under the age of 60, $7.50. As you know, we have a grant that pays uh, for our meals, uh, for Meals on Wheels, as well as our meals that are served to those who are over 60. For Las Cruces Public Libraries, uh, most of our programs and services are free, but we do charge for lost and damaged items as well as, as you can see there, um, our Wi-Fi hotspots and kits. We do actually check those out occasionally, that equipment, so people can have Wi-Fi at home if they don't have it. And, we, and if those kits are returned to us damaged, we charge for those. We do not charge fines for overdue library materials. And here's our museums uh, charges. Admission to all museums is free. Thanks to your support for that. Uh, that is not true in many cities, and we are proud to be one of the few cities that does allow our museums to be open to the public that way. Uh, we have museum camps for young people, and those range in price according to the kinds of sponsorships we can get for those classes, those camps. Studio programs, those are our evening studio art classes. And again, that range is due to who the instructor is, what they're teaching, and how much the supplies are. Uh, field trips we do occasionally, and then our room rental charge is there for you to see. Uh, we recommend that you adopt this proposed fees and charges schedule for the Quality of Life Department for the remainder of FY24 and for FY25, Exhibit A that's in your packet. We also are asking with this action to repeal previous resolutions related to fees and charges, and those are listed there. So your options here are vote yes to approve, no to deny, you can vote to amend or table. And I'll stand for any questions you might have. Thank you. Any questions, Councilor Curran? I, not questions, I just wanna thank you for presenting this and I really do wanna thank you for the commitment to serving Las Cruces. When I have people in from out of town and we go to a museum, I am always, they're always, they always say like, oh, can I pay for something? And I say, oh yeah, you can, you can pay for, for it when we go to the museums. And um, so I, I think that I really appreciate your commitment to providing accessibility. There are uh, so many free services and, and the fact that people can take a little longer to read and not panic is, is beautiful. So I just wanna thank you for, for your ongoing commitment to really providing services at, at the lowest cost possible always um, in quality of life. And so thank you and thank you for your presentation today. Thank you. Councilor Flotis. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor, and thank you, Ms. Bray. I just wanna thank you for the energy you've brought to the department and, um, and the innovations. And I especially support, uh, thank you for your support for the City Art Board. It's uh, the best board I've seen in the seven years I've been on it. So they're doing a fantastic job and you have a lot to do with that as well. So thank you, thank you very much. Thank you, Councilor Flores. Thank you, Mayor. Um, yes, ditto to my colleagues, absolutely agree with that. Um, and thank you for bringing this forward. And I know our city clerk Rivera will tell me if this is not an appropriate question for now, but um, a couple of weeks ago during my council comments, I raised um, the issue of the ESL classes that were very popular. And so I just wondered if you could speak on that and if there's anything you need from the council to continue those because that's, I, I keep hearing that that is a great service that 
that you all offered. Yes, thank you, Mayor Pro Tem. And Mayor and Mayor Pro Tem, I just want to mention that uh, this is, I guess it's all right because Christine has not said no. So again, Carol Bray for the record. Uh, so uh, yes, the, we were providing those classes, the English as a second language and uh, GED preparation and also citizenship classes as part of a grant that we received. And uh, that grant ran out, but uh, we are looking for ways to continue providing that. We had a volunteer instructor who left us, unfortunately. Uh, we would like to hire someone, but uh, we have a, a new request for a position for FY25, we don't know yet where that will go, but we also agree that is a very important service and we will continue to look for ways to provide it. So thank you. Thank you, I appreciate that so much and hopefully our grants department is tuning in and can um, continue working with you to find um, some of those funds again. Yes, thank you. Thank you, so thank you Mayor Portem. Okay, at this time, are there any members of the public that have any comments? Okay, seeing none. Christine? This is on the motion to approve resolution 24-101. Councillor McClure? Yes. Councillor Matisse? Yes. Councillor Graham? Yes. Councillor Coran? Yes. Councillor Flores? Yes. Councillor Bencomo? Yes. Mayor? Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we have Council Bill Number 24-023, Ordinance Number 365, an ordinance approving a zone change from R4C, multiple dwelling high density and limited retail and office conditional, to R4, multi dwelling high density limited retail and office for property encompassing 2.908 plus acres and located at 1712 and 722 Hedney Place and 725 Basha Arc, submitted by M&M Building Solutions representative. Move to approve, Graham. Second, Corin. To present, Adam Ochoa. Good afternoon, Council. Adam Ochoa, Community Development for the Record. Uh, before we do have a zone change for properties at 712, 722 Hendy, and 725 ba uh, Bashak Arc. <clears throat> Currently, the property is zoned R4, which is multi dwelling high density and limited retail and office conditional. That condition being that buildings to be constructed on this R4 property are limited to one story in height. <clears throat> Subject properties uh, combined totally, uh, totally combined. Uh, uh, I'll start over. <laughs> the three properties combined encompass approximately 2.908 acres, and they are all three currently vacant or undeveloped. Showing the zoning map here, here are those three properties here, shown in the back part of what is the Badmore Estate subdivision that was uh, uh, subdivided uh, not too long ago. As you can see, just a hodgepodge of uh, uh, zoning within the area. It's got commercial north on, uh, commercial zone north on Stern, multifamily zoning to the south, and uh, of course, the interstate to the, the interstate to the east, and uh, single family to the west, predominantly. Showing here the aerial again, those three vacant properties here, single family here to the west, and we do have multifamily development here to the south, as well as some two-story multifamily here a little further south on Stern, to give you an idea of what, what, what's all around in this area. Uh, what is being proposed is a zone change to R4, multi-dwelling high density limited retail and office, essentially removing that condition on height restrictions. This would allow the applicant to uh, develop a multi-story development, uh, multi-story apartment complex. Uh, it would increase multi-family units. Uh, they will meet all the site design elements that are required from their development. And uh, just to let you know, the applicant did let, this, the applicant um, <clears throat> is the same owner who did the entire subdivision of Banmore Estates. They did let everybody who purchased lots or homes in that Banmore Estates directly adjacent to these three lots uh, in their covenants let them know that that they were going to go before city council again to try to get another zone change to go to multi-story. So everybody in that new subdivision who purchased those lots or those homes are aware of the, uh, um, the proposal that's coming before you today as well. Here are those three lots. Uh, shown here, 
Uh, when staff did our analysis, we did see no health, safety, or welfare issues uh, associated with the proposed zone change. Uh, we did see that the proposed zone change is compatible with the surrounding prop, uh, surrounding area, but we do have multifamily and multifamily two-story development just uh, south and east of this property. Additionally, the proposed zone change al aligns with Elevate Las Cruces. This is a suburban place type, uh, which has a mixed-use environment which uh, with multiple uses, single-family uh, uses, multifamily uses, retail uses, office uses, uh, and other ancillary uses. So it's just another... Uh, a check mark, if you will, that is within the suburban place type is what, what they're being proposed today. Public notice was sent out to surrounded property owners within 500 feet of the subject property. Uh, staff did receive one phone call uh, in opposition, uh, two emails and additional two emails today, so four in opposition to the proposed zone change. Uh, staff did receive also one phone call in support. Additionally, we did get two phone calls just asking for information of the proposed zone change. On January 23rd, 2024, the Planning and Zoning Commission did meet uh, to review the proposed zone change. Uh, after very minor discussion, because there's no public input at that time, uh, nobody spoke up against the zone change. The Planning and Zoning Commission did vote to recommend approval for the proposed zone change based on the findings within their staff report and as found in one of your exhibits as well. Those are the findings shown here. Uh, the proposed zone change is supported by Elevate Las Cruces, uh, allows for development of vacant property in a, in a rather established area of the town, fosters more rational development between different residential land uses, uh, what could be consistent with the residential developments of the surrounding neighborhood, and subject property is located adjacent to a minor arterial roadway where multifamily development and zoning is encouraged. That is the conclusion of my presentation, uh, but uh, your options today are one to vote yes and we'll, we'll to approve. Uh, this would align with the recommendation of the Planning and Zoning Commission and the, and the subject property is to be rezoned from R4C to R4. Uh, two to vote no and deny uh, the proposed zone change. Three to vote to amend uh, and add conditions that deem appropriate. Or four to table and postpone direct staff and the applicant accordingly. Uh, that is the conclusion of my presentation again, and I stand for questions. All right, thank you, Adam. Mayor Pro Tem. Thank you. Thank you, Adam. Just so that I'm clear, Adam, um, in 2020, my very first council meeting ever lasted till about 8 p.m. that day, and we were talking about this, sim this same area. Is this a totally, this is a totally different proposal. It is not an amendment to what we decided then, correct? Um, Mayor, uh, Mayor Pro Tem Como, uh, th this is not the same area actually. Okay. So this, this is part of that Banmore Estate subdivision. This is just a portion of it, as you can see, the very southeastern portion of that Banmore Estates. The remainder of the, the area still zoned R1A, uh, and this is the only area that was zoned R4 with that condition of limiting the height of the structure. So it's it's the same property we're looking at. I understand. So it was part of that initial conversation. That's correct. It, the request now is for the yes, to remove the, the conditions. Yes. Great. Thank you so much. I just needed to be clear. Councilor Fortes. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Mr. Ochoa. What's the difference between um, R4C, because the C is commercial in that R4C, right? Mr. No? Mayor, uh, Councilor Flores, no ma'am. The C in the end basically stands for conditional. And that condition being, yeah. the, being that it's limited, uh, limiting the height of structures to one story on those properties. So that's the difference. Oh. R4C has a condition. R4, there's no conditions on it. So it can be as it could be a three-story building because I think three stories is our maximum, right, in the city of Las Cruces, except for that big building, that old Wells Fargo. Mayor Council do Flores, we, don't we have a restriction or a limit on how many stories? Mayor Council Flores, yes, ma'am. The R4 zoning district allows for up to 60 feet in height, which is how how, how 60 feet. Mayor Councilor Flores, that would be roughly about four stories tall. Four, four stories. Four, I thought it was okay. four or five stories tall. I thought it was three. I thought it was a three-story limit. Is that res? Well, this is residential, though. Okay. Well, I had that wrong, but it allows it to be higher than that. Mayor uh, Councilor Flores, that is correct. And so oh no! So under the proposed R four zoning designation, 
The cap is still maximum height plus 60 feet in height. I don't believe the applicant is looking to go that tall, uh, but that is what's allowed by right in the R4 zoning district. Pues entonces, para qué es? What is it for? I mean, what, what, what effect will that change make? Mayor Council Flores, what it'll allow them to do is still do multi-story because currently under the conditions with the zoning, they're limited to one story in height only. By removing that condition, they could go to multi-stories, two, three stories. Maybe. When you make these proposals or these changes internally, do you um, ask the uh, surrounding community what they would like or do you just uh, bring it to city council? Mayor Council Flores, we do have public hearings uh, at the Planning Zone Commission to have the opportunity to voice their opinions there as well. We do send out notices, we, we advertise in the Sun News, and we post a sign on the property as well when it's ready to come to public hearing. At that time, we take any public notice. They could come to those meetings, provide their input as well. Uh, but like I said, at the Planning Zone Commission, nobody was there. there. Literally, the only person in the crowd was the applicant. And then once this, uh, say it was to go into effect, what uh, sort of structure can the owner uh, build? Uh, mayor, a anything that, uh, that is 60 feet high or what? Councilor Flood is the mayor. Uh, essentially what they're limited to are, are apartment, uh, apartment units. I see. Uh, is, what's the, is what they're proposing is, oh, is apartment I see. complex. That's the purpose. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Ochoa. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Councilor McCullough. Some of my questions have already been answered, but um, I do also wonder about um, if something had been set into motion in 2020, why that was not given as a background for planning and zoning, and how does that not factor into our decision making right now? Mm. Councilor McClure, Mayor, uh, essentially the condition was placed under at City Council. Uh, it was trying to be brought forward as just straight R4 zoning by staff and the applicant, uh, but that condition was placed on uh, li the limiting the height of the building uh, by at the city council meeting by council um, because of public uh, public input and the surrounding neighborhood uh, wanting to put that condition on that property. Is the applicant here? Um, I believe they are here. Some of them might have stepped out to the restroom, man. Because I would also like clarification on what they're aiming to build. Because partially why it might have been until 8 o'clock at night is that there were a lot of people in opposition to this, especially for multiple stories. And I'm all down for housing. But if you look at what's being built there, the part of the conversation in 2020 was affordable housing. And I'm not sure if that's exactly what they're aiming to do right now. Oh. Council McClure, um, uh, Mayor, no, they are not looking at doing that. They're doing, trying to do just straight regular apartment complexes, but they're trying to do. If you read in, the, uh, in their actual covenants that they sent out to property owners when they signed it, they, what they're proposing is a two-story apartment complexes on those, on those. Thank you. Yes. Uh, Adam, I know that... Uh, when it was brought up before, one of the big issues was the traffic yes. study. So has, uh, has that been uh, addressed in this case? Mayor, I believe the traffic impact analysis was done with the actual creation of the subdivision. That's why those roadways were built out the way they were. Uh, if we remember, um, Bout and Stern were both just essentially two two-lane roads. They have been widened in front of the subdivision. Uh, additional traffic analysis are probably going to be re required by the engineer by our engineering section for whenever they propose whatever it is that they're proposing on the property, depending on the number of units that they'll be putting on there and whatever traffic generation it creates. Sir. Okay, Mr. Weir, you have. Mayor and City Council, I'd just like to add a, a, a few more comments. Back in 2020, uh, the whole entire subdivision was uh, platted for development and also the zoning was placed on it. So with the property remaining R4, the density is the same proposed today as it was at that time. Um, the, the developer could potentially get the same number of units, they just may need to be smaller and not as large of units at a one story. Um, at a two-story, it allows them to, uh, they still are con 
constrained by that R4 zoning, it just would allow them to be build big, bigger units instead of a studio or one bedroom apartment, they may be able to uh, build two or three apartments. Um, those are all just from a technical of what the property is zoned and what the, the build out of the, took place uh, with the um, subdivision itself. Uh, we would still have to go through that building permit review. And just um, some other history when that initial uh, project was proposed, there was a lot of comments about the intersection and the developer was required to make those improvements which are in place. There was also a lot of discussion about the drainage in the area and a lot of water used to pool in that area. And so those were also addressed with the construction of the subdivision. And just a, as another note, um, the R1 area or the single family area has a height of 35 feet. So there is the potential for those single family homes to be built at a two story level also. So, uh, oh, and uh, also uh, they could go to three with creative design. So just uh, wanted to add that to uh, for your consideration today. Okay, thank you, Dave. I have additional comments, Mayor. Go ahead, Mayor. Thank you, thank you, David, for that um, information. I, uh, you know, I, as I was reading this, I could have sworn that we had allowed two units for the apartment complexes back in 2020 that were on Stern Drive. Is that a correct recollection? Mayor mm Bacomo, -hmm. uh, Mayor, where, where do you mean? I'm sorry, because the everything else, as you can see here, is zone R and A. The only ones that are zoned for multifamily are those three lots in that, in that subdivision area, ma'am. Okay. Um, Mayor and Mayor Pro Tem, I, um, there is an apartment project to the south in this area that is constructed at, at two stories, so it's um, not a, a new development type within the area. Okay. Um, just a long time ago. My memory betrays me from a week ago, frankly. So. Um, I did just want to point out, though, that last time we also heard a lot of comments about yes. um, there was a lot of misinformation about the kinds of people that live in apartment complexes. And so I hope that I know there's a lot of folks here today that I hope that that is because the the concerns about traffic were super accurate. The concerns about the Bouts Lake were super accurate. Um, and some of those pieces have been corrected. I think bouts for a long time, the, those folks, we've talked to Public Works about the concerns about traffic ca traffic calming there as well. So for me, it's always, you know, Hoagland and bouts and um, all of these different, McClure, these different streets that have these requests for traffic calming um, that are, I think, both a separate issue as well that needs to be addressed. But I do hope that as public commenters come up here, that you, you know, that there is, um, the, I hope that you're not talking with the same misinformation pieces regarding apartment complexes, who lives at apartment complexes, and that, quote unquote, those people will um, lower your property values. That is, those things are not proven, those things have proven to be not true. Um, and I think in a moment where we have a rental unit shortage, whether it's affordable or market rate, we have a rental unit shortage of 5,600 rental units. And those are the pieces that also go into the consideration for um, at least myself. So I just wanted to make those points before we move on. Mr. Mayor. If go I ahead, Councilor Matisse. Mr. Chaw, Mr. Weir. Uh, is the condition two stories, I mean, is there a cap on two stories? When you say 60 feet, that could be three stories, four stories, and it could even be five stories. Is it a two-story apartment building being built? Mayor, Councilor Matisse, uh, from the documentation that the applicant has provided staff, uh, all, all signs point that they're trying to do a two-story apartment complex, sir. Okay, and, and that's for sure. Yes, sir, uh, but again, the, the, the zone change is for just to remove the conditions, so in other words, 60 feet would be the max, if you will, but they're not looking at going that tall, sir. Mr. Weir. Um, Mr. Chair and uh, Councillor Matisse, uh, something that the, the council can consider is instead of using the language stories, you could go to a height. Um, your third option was to amend this resolution. So um, if you were concerned about the maximum height in that area, you could match the 35 feet that's allowed in the single family zone. 
and not use the stories. And then it's a matter of the developer, um, what project he can propose within that, those parameters. I concur with that, thank you. Okay, you said the developer was here, or is somewhere? I did see him, sir, I haven't seen him yet, so he, he, he might be working on other projects, but uh, uh, if we do need to work with that, uh, uh, I'll try to get in contact and get him back in here, sir. Okay, we'll, we'll, we'll get to the public comments, and I'm sure there's a uh, public that wishes to speak to this issue. Can I see a show of hands? Okay, do, do you all have a certain spokesperson for your group, or it's all individual? Individual, then, then we'll go ahead and go with, with two minutes. You can all come up and speak. Uh, just start working your way down, and you can come up and speak. Good afternoon again. My name is Dolores Bernal. I represent uh, Save the Road Runner at savetheroadrunner.org. I am a little appalled about the way uh, city employees like Mr. Adam and Mr. David Weir operate. I was at the PNC uh, commission meeting last week, and the commissioners were asking questions, just like you are. And they're like, what about this? And what about that? And Mr. Adam was the only one providing him input. Um, a minute ago, he said that the developer went to the bathroom, and now he says, I don't know, maybe he's working on another project. I think you need to be looking into some of the statements being made by your city employees a little closer. Um, I think a lot of people here are a little confused as to the input that is provided uh, minutes before this meeting, during this meeting, and then they're dismissed automatically when it's time to take it to a vote. So what is really the process here? People come here, offer input, and then boom, the PNC commissioners vote because these two gentlemen tell them to. And then same thing here. Uh, they present something to you, you just take them for their word, and then boom, you, you approve it. Uh, so they're not respecting uh, residents' input, and let alone even the idea of having wildlife surveys on these areas that are being developed. So gentlemen, I'm gonna be coming to all the meetings and I'm gonna be pointing out just how ridiculous this whole process looks. Thank you. If you wish to speak, you can start making your way down to somewhere in the front if you'd like. Good afternoon again. My name is Diane Williams. Um, I attended several of the meetings back in 2019 and 2020. There would be more of us here now if we had been notified of what was going on. My understanding was they only notified people with five, in 500 feet, which is a park, a few um, duplexes, and a subdivision that hasn't been built yet, but it's making very good progress being built. All of the residential areas beyond the subdivision None of us were notified. Our main, main point of protest is traffic. Traffic, you know, we heard, heard all this stuff about, oh, 15,000 vehicles for bouts. Well, maybe that's true on the five-lane part of bouts that answered Valley. We are a two-lane road after that. We have no lights. I mean, we have no lights in the streets. There are lights on bouts. There are no sidewalks. There are no curbs. There is very little shoulder. Um, the shoulder on one side abutes to a drainage canal. It's a hazard for the kids in the neighborhood. It's a hazard for cyclists. It's a hazard for people walking. Um, that is our objection. It was approved for the three single story um, back then. Um, you know, we would have been at the zoning uh, meetings. Uh, we would have provided more input formally had we known about it. Most of us found out about it on Friday. That's all. All right, thank you, ma'am. Good afternoon, Mayor. Good afternoon, Mayor Pro Tem. 
Members of the City Council. My name is Patrick Dawson. I'm a resident in the uh, immediate area of this proposed change from an R4C with a condition of one story to an R4 with a condition of up to 60 feet currently as uh, uh, reported. Sir, could you speak a little closer to Mike a little louder? Sorry about that. Is that a little better? I'm sorry, just a little louder. Okay, is this a little better? Oh, thanks, sir. Again, my name is Patrick Dawson. I'm a uh, resident in the immediate area. I did attend the last meeting that we had regarding this that imposed that condition. A lot of it did uh, have to do with, obviously, the uh, concerns of the traffic flow, which has not been changed significantly. Uh, there has been some work done on the road, uh, but it still remains a two-lane uh, my directional road. There is a turn lane that's been incorporated for access to uh, one part of the um, development on the, I would say, northwest side and also on the uh, northeast side. But apart from that, the traffic flow is the same. There is no light that goes uh, in the southbound direction or southwestern uh, direction from Bouts. Uh, as you uh, enter Bouts from Valley southbound or southwest bound, it goes from a uh, basically a four-lane road to a two-lane, goes under a bridge, the Interstate uh, 10 overpass. It's a 35-mile-an-hour zone at that point. It reduces to a 25-mile-an-hour zone right after the intersection with Stern. Uh, there is some curbing that has been placed there. That curbing has been hit multiple times already by vehicles. Uh, you can see the, the skid marks on those. Uh, there, while this construction was going on, there was actually a vehicle that hit one of the fire hydrants uh, at one of the residences on Bouts, uh, just opposite this construction that's going on currently, uh, caused a, a flooding situation for some of the residents in the immediate area. Uh, traffic does not necessarily go from 25 to 35 that quickly. Uh, we do have traffic that goes through, is my two minutes up? Sorry about that, I'll let, let yes, it sir. go at that. But traffic flow is, a, it, it remains to be a concern. And secondly, there are no uh, two-story residences anywhere near those three lots. You go down south, maybe a half a mile, and you'll find your first one and the only one. Thank All you, right. sir. Thank you, sir. <clears throat> My name is Jaquella Garrison, and I live in that uh, uh, Buena Vista area housing area and i use the road almost daily until i got sick but i'm going to be going back out there doing it we used to ride our bikes and everything it was 25 miles per hour and even then before this development came into um, rotation to have all these other homes the traffic was still going down that road about more than 25, 35 miles an hour. And uh, we were being concerned. And that was one of the reasons why that uh, back in 2020 that we came here because it was impacting the safety of children who do not have a park nearby their homes to, to play or ride their bicycles. And now this gentleman wants to put a two-story building, which if we change the zoning, it could, they could change their minds and want to put a three-story because they don't want to do the one-story. And it's all because of money. And I was hoping that we would be able to use it, that land for a park for the kids that are in the residential areas or surrounding it. There is a, a park down further towards the university, but it's, it's not a very large park. And uh, I think the benefit of a park there for people who have their dogs and stuff uh, would be a much better choice than an apartment building that will add to uh, speeding and uh, unsafe uh, 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 usage of the road. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Good evening again. My name is Dan Parrott. 
and I'll make this fairly brief. This uh, relates back to my previous comments concerning zoning and zoning changes. Uh, from what I've observed, there was a lot of confusion about the way this was proposed and the way it was presented. Uh, from my perspective, I would request plans from the developers for a firm plan as to what they're planning on doing. Are they planning on a single story, two story, or multiple stories up to 60 feet? Um, there's different options on what can be decided here, either a yes, no amendments, or to table the discussions for the day. Uh, there's been previous discussions of traffic issues. Uh, gentleman's asking for back pass. We've heard that the streets are fairly narrow in this area. And uh, the one um, suggestion that was made was to limit the height of the building to 35 feet would, would basically be a 30 or two story, 35 foot tall building. Uh, I would request just as a simple matter of courtesy, the plans be approved prior to the zoning changes being made so that we know what's going there. Um, the last comment that I'll make about the zoning changes in the city, and this concerns the city as a whole, is that in the high range area from time to time we see planning signs that are up, but the print is so fine that unless you park your car, hike across the lot to see what's actually being proposed, you have no clue as a resident. I would propose the city put up a large enough sign with a property number on it, a phone number, an email, or a text number where the citizens can make comments as to what they would propose and what they would like to see done with that property. Thank you for your time. Mayor, City Council, my name is Joe LaRock. <clears throat> and uh, I wanted to say, first of all, that uh, planning and zoning had no protest at their meetings. Well, they notified the subdivision, which nobody's living there, property owners are building houses. Before I was here in 2020, the mayor at that time said we had the largest protest outpouring that he had ever seen in his entire terms as mayor. The whole object was traffic and the character of the community. At that time, he wanted six houses per acre. We got that changed to third acres and quarter acres, and we restricted the apartments to one level, trying to continue the character of the area and the traffic. Well, all they built was basically an extra lane to turn into the subdivision. And I don't feel that there was any adequate notice given to the community around the subdivision. I mean, I don't drive on Stearns, I drive on Bouts. I don't see a little sign on Stearns. I saw nothing on Bouts whatsoever. And I don't feel that this is anything but an attempt by the developer to go around what the previous city council and community had put in place for valid reasons. He's trying to get this passed so that it doesn't come up to the community again. And again, I hope you all will just flat out refuse it because it's nothing but a, a, an attempt to go behind what was already done. Thank you. Henry Young, once again. I didn't even know this was coming up today, but as a former member of Planning and Zoning Commission, as well as chair from, I uh, can remember the entire time, 2005 to 2010, the last three years as chair, I'd like to clarify some of the things for council that have been brought up. As I say, I don't have a dog in the fight. I'm neither pro nor con. But let me explain something that, uh, that I've heard, two things. The way this was approved originally, a park cannot go in there because it wasn't put into the restrictions at that time. So they can build under the previous plan and put in um, 
anything that would go with the previous recommendations. Now, changing from R4C to R4, if they go three stories high, they would probably go beyond the required number of tenants on three stories. You follow? It doesn't matter how what the height is, if they went to three stories, they would already be higher than the R4 limit. So we can't go so much by the height, go by the R4, unless you want to make sure that there can be no more than a certain amount, then you go with the height requirement. Thank you. Hi, my name is Patricia Nevu. I'm a resident of the area that is south of the new subdivision. I have grandchildren who take the bus on bouts. We don't have any sidewalks. The bus drops the children off on a dirt sidewalk. We have four traffic lights. We love our neighborhood. It is rural looking. You would not believe that you are in Las Cruces. We, well, all we're asking is to keep the character of the neighborhood. We have no problem with the apartments. We do have problem with traffic. We have a two-lane road. Like I said, the buses drop our children off on a dirt strip on only one side of the road. The other side of the road, there are trees and bushes. It is dangerous for the children. We ask that you keep this apartment to a smaller size because of the traffic flow on our narrow roads and because our children, um, like I say, they have no open areas. They, if they want to visit each other, they have to cross these roads. It's dangerous as it is, but to add more traffic to the area is going to be a hazard for our children and our grandchildren. Thank you. My name is Dale Hansen. I live at 1105 Muddy Lisa Lane with my wife Donna. We've lived there for 34 years. Uh, I was here the previous time that we had these discussions and the gallery behind me was full. It went long. We had done our research. There was a video presentation that went along with it. And I thought we, we made our point very clearly. But the commission and the mayor needs to realize is that the final result for R4C was a compromise. Our neighborhood wanted no apartments. We wanted larger lots than were proposed. The developer wanted apartments, multi-story apartments. After long discussion, the commission and the mayor decided that there would be uh, there was a compromise that said there would be apartments, but they'd be limited to one story. And so we shook hands and left. Not everybody was completely satisfied with it, but we left that meeting knowing that there would be one story apartments. Here comes the development. We're watching it unfold in front of us right now. And out of the blue, we are told that it's going to be, well, that promise that we made back in 2020, we may amend that now to some specious idea of what might come about. Maybe it's two stories, maybe it's three, we don't know. Where's the developer? We're not sure. It doesn't, it smells like a, a fish factory when the ice runs out, is what it smells like right now. And what I want you to realize is that it was a compromise and that you have an opportunity to make good on your promise to this neighborhood that was made before. Thank you. And good afternoon, Mayor, Councilors. 
Um, a lot of what's been said was what I was going to say, but that's okay, because the main emphasis here is about the traffic. And I'm sorry, I'm sorry, sorry. What Robert is McCorkle, Robert McCorkle, my wife and I live on Marilisa Lane across from Dell. We were here at the first meeting. I see familiar faces, Ben Como and Yvonne Flores. They were there, and they know all that went into this. And so here we go again. Uh, it's fitting this is on April Fool's Day because I think we're being played for fools. Okay, and um, I want to know what's changed in, in that four years and why all of a sudden this is going to be proposed. Uh, we, we'll have enough problems with traffic uh, with the existing subdivision going in. A one-story apartment, that's going to add a bunch of vehicles. Two-story, three-story, many more vehicles. And for us who live on Mara Lisa Lane, there's only one way out of our neighborhood, and that's going down Bouts Road. So if you're heading into the city, you come to that traffic light at Valley and Bouts, and this traffic is going to stack up, I can guarantee you. It does occasionally now. So that's a big issue. Uh, the way this whole thing was proposed, the notice it was given was minimal. Uh, there's one little yellow sign in the subdivision facing inward talking about this upcoming public hearing. That is not adequate by any means. And I want to know how somebody can stand up here and talk about international issues for three minutes, and we're limited to, on local issue to two minutes. That makes no sense to me. Um, so I hope you all will reconsider this. I hope you'll reject it. I think it's a bad idea. And, and I don't know how much of these apartments going to cost to rent. I know how much these houses are. They're going 400000 to 600000 plus dollars. Thank you for your time. Good afternoon, Mayor. Congratulations to our new city manager. Well-deserved, counselors. Um, my name is David Stout. I live in the area of West Bouts at the far west end of Papillon Lane. All the lots down there are half acre. All of you that were here the last several council meetings that we've addressed this problem, um, we wanted the larger lots where the gentleman that they're talking about is Scott Bannister. He's nowhere to be found. He never is. Uh, I've addressed several things with him over this subdivision. Everything that you all heard before, I don't need to repeat it because you're all aware of it. He hasn't kept his promise on any of it yet. One of the major issues that I discussed is the irrigation ditch that runs down Bouts Road. And there was a comment made, there's an irrigation ditch? Well, it's there, but now it's going to be the first home that has been built. That ditch sits inside the property line. So it's in somebody's backyard. And the guys doing the rock wall, they actually buried the ditch. Had to get them to dig it out. It's been full of weeds. It's a problem. Uh, the rock wall that the city required them to put up by the sidewalk, now that dirt ditch, it leaks under the walls and into the street. They asked for wider, or wider roadways. He did, he did what he said he was going to do. He did put the turning lanes in. But for some reason, the engineer decides that there needs to be an island put in there for people to run over the top of their vehicle that drive larger vehicles. Not everybody drives a little sport fancy sports car so it tears up their vehicles it's filling up with dirt and weeds right now there's no outlets for the water to run out of it so it it holds water in ponds there um the whole deal was just wasn't planned properly um i was glad to see somebody take over that property that sat vacant for so long and build build homes there it is turning out to be a nice subdivision the deal was to keep it as single story that was a compromise just like what was said previously and I think we need to take that into consideration, but we also need to hold him accountable. Make sure he does his job. Thank you for your consideration. Is there anyone else? Mayor, Mayor okay. I have some thoughts. Yeah, Mayor Pro Tem, go ahead. Thank you so much. Um, thank you, sir. I'm glad you brought that up earlier as um, you all were coming up. I told Mayor I'd wanted to raise something else because I, I actually really do wish the developer was here. Um, I think that would clarify a lot of misinformation, a lot of 
doubt, whatever that might be, and so I feel like that's important. Additionally, I really wanted to actually address the issue of the irrigation ditch. I've had many phone calls, and I've told you all many times that um, while those lots remained empty, or even if purchased and the house is not being lived in yet, the irrigation on the south side of Bouts is the responsibility of the property owners, and many of them clean them out themselves. I know that one of the neighbors further down Bouts actually one day went out and cleaned all of that irrigation ditch on his own, and so I do feel like um, there's been many compromises made on both sides, and one of the sort of, you know, trying to be a better neighbor um, as they build this new subdivision is to clean up that ditch, and so I was kind of hoping that they would be here. Um, yes, Mr. Troy, I can see you're wanting to say yeah, something. Mayor, Mayor Pro Tem, I don't know if I saw me on my phone. I was actually in communication with my staff. I believe I saw the applicant's representative here earlier in the front desk. He actually was not. He's actually out sick, about, so I apologize about that, ma'am. He is not present today. I well, do apologize. Mayor, if you don't mind, I would like to at least table it for two more weeks so that the... Uh, developer is here. I think it's important that the developer talk about the plans um, and is able to answer some of the questions. I would just say two weeks. Well, if you want to have a motion, if we have a motion and uh, a second. second. Oh, second. Okay, so we have a motion to table for two weeks. No, I'm saying what the motion is. Is you put? Are you putting a date on it, a time? Yes, thank you, Mayor. I would say April fifteenth. Is that? That is the next meeting. Yes, okay, ma thank you. Yes, that would be my motion to table to April fifteenth. Okay. This is on the motion to table Ordinance three zero six five to April fifteenth, twenty twenty four. Councilor McClure. Yes. Councilor Matisse. Yes. Councilor Graham. Yes. Councilor Cran. Yes. Councilor Flores. No. Councilor Bencomo. Yes. And Mayor. Yes. Mr. Mayor. Question for Mr. Ochoa. Yep. Mr. Yep. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Mr. Ochoa. Well, we, uh, we've already closed that item. No. Oh, we've closed it. We can't talk about it. Yeah, we're done. Sorry. But you. That, that's really a disservice. Yeah. So next on the item is board appointments. So Councilor Bencomo appoints Denali Wilson to the library board and Alana Bradley to the Parks and Rec board and reappoints Joe Castillo to the Health and Human Services Advisory Committee. Councilor McClure appoints Charlotte Lipson to the Health and Human Services Advisory Committee and reappoints Stephen Jones to the Library Board. Councilor Graham appoints Jessica Streeter to the Library Board. So each one of these individually. Okay, so we need a motion and a second to vote for the following. A vote is required for the following appointments. Fred Rayish, Rash, a reappointment to the Parks and Rec Board. Move to approve. Second, Graham. This is on the motion to reappoint Fred Rash to the Parks and Rec Board. Councilor McClure? Yes. Councilor Matisse? Yes. Councilor Graham? Yes. Councilor Coran? Yes. Councilor Flores? Yes. Councilor Bencomo? Yes. And Mayor? Yes. Now I need a motion and a second to appoint Mayor Mary Diesel reappointment to the Transit Board. Move to approve. Moved. Second, Graham. This is on the motion to reappoint Mary Diesel to the Transit Advisory Board. Councilor McClure? Yes. Councilor Matisse? Yes. Councilor Graham? Yes. Councilor Coran? Yes. Councilor Flores? Yes. Councilor Bencomo? Yes. Mayor? Yes. 
Also need a motion and a second uh, for Michael Harris, a reappointment to the Transit Board. Move to approve, Graham. Second, Corin. This is on the motion to reappoint Michael Harris to the Transit Advisory Board. Councilor McClure? Yes. Councilor Matisse? Yes. Councilor Graham? Yes. Councilor Cran? Yes. Councilor Flores? Yes. Councilor Bencomo? Yes. Mayor? Yes. Need a motion and a second uh, for Daniel Buck, reappointment to the Transit Board. Move to approve, Corin. Second, Graham. This is on the motion to reappoint Daniel Buck to the Transit Advisory Board. Councilor McClure? Yes. Councilor Matisse? Yes. Councilor Graham? Yes. Councilor Cran? Yes. Councilor Flores? No. Councilor Bencomo? Yes. And Mayor? Yes. Need a motion and a second for Selmari Allen, a new appointment to the ADA committee. Move to approve. Second, Graham. This is on the motion to appoint Selmari Allen to the ADA committee. Councilor McClure? Yes. Councilor Matisse? Yes. Councilor Graham? Yes. Councilor Cran? Yes. Councilor Flores? Yes. Councilor Bencomo? Yes. Mayor? Yes. Next is Isaac Taylor Weiss. We need a motion and a second reappointment to the ADA committee. So moved by Flores. Second, Graham. This is on the motion to reappoint Isaac Taylor Wise to the ADA committee. Councilor McClure? Yes. Councilor Matisse? Yes. Councilor Graham? Yes. Councilor Cran? Yes. Councilor Flores? Yes. Councilor Bencomo? Yes. Mayor? Yes. Next is a reappointment to the ADA committee, Ronald Rivera. So moved, Corin. Second. This is on the motion to reappoint Ronald Rivera to the ADA committee. Councilor McClure? Yes. Councilor Matisse? Yes. Councilor Graham? Yes. Councilor Cran? Yes. Councilor Flores? Yes. Councilor Bencomo? Yes. Mayor? Yes. Next, I need a motion and a second for Joanne Rodriguez Hot, reappointment to the Senior Program Advisory Board. So moved by Flores. Second. Bencomo. This is on the motion to reappoint Joanne Rodriguez Hawk to the Senior Programs Advisory Board. Councilor McClure? Yes. Councilor Matisse? Yes. Councilor Graham? Yes. Councilor Cran? Yes. Councilor Flores? Yes. Councilor Bencomo? Yes. Mayor? Yes. Next, a motion and a second for David Hernandez, reappointment to the Senior Programs Advisory Board. Move to approve, Corin. Second, Flores. This is on the motion to reappoint David Hernandez to the Senior Programs Advisory Board. Councilor McClure? Yes. Councilor Matisse? Yes. <laughs> Thank you. Councilor Graham? Yes. Councilor Cran? Yes. Councilor Flores? Yes. Councilor Bencomo? Yes. Mayor? Yes. Next is a second and a motion for Larry Altamirano, reappointment to the Senior Programs Advisory Board. Move to approve, Graham. Second, Corin. This is on the motion to reappoint Larry Altamirano to the Senior Programs Advisory Board. Councilor McClure? Yes. Councilor Matisse? Yes. Councilor Graham? Yes. Councilor Cran? Yes. Councilor Flores? Yes. Councilor Bencomo? Yes. And Mayor? Yes. Need a second and a motion for Debbie Moore, reappointment to the Affordable Housing Committee. So moved by Flores. Second, second Graham. Bencomo. This is on the motion to reappoint Debbie Moore to the Affordable Housing Committee. Councilor McClure? Yes. Councilor Matisse? Yes. Councilor Graham? Yes. Councilor Cran? Yes. Councilor Flores? Yes. Councilor Bencomo? Yes. Mayor? Yes. We're done? Okay. Next is a notice of proposed ordinance. Bring it forward. Thank you, Councilor. So this is 10.1 Council Bill number 24-024, ordinance number 366, an ordinance com confirming the successful completion of the Local Economic Development Act LIDA project with X2N SAT, 
uh, Inc. and authorizing its termination to include the project participation agreement, intergovernmental agreement, and the release of the 150,000 guaranteed that has served as security for the project. Bring it forward. I'm carrying it for you, Councillor Flores. So we have for what is Christine? Go for it. Okay, so we're bringing it forward. Thank you. Next, we have the yeah, City Council Member Board and Reports. Um, I'll start at the end with uh, Councillor McClure. Thank you, Mayor. I just wanted to say that um, I also have faith in the city manager's ability to do his job and have had nothing but good interactions with him even before I was a counselor. Um, what I feel is that as a writer, I've, I place a hot, huge premium on communication. And this is still a very uncomfortable forum for me to speak in public. But I think communication builds trust and I feel like we failed in that for this round. And I think going forward, that's the drumbeat I will have on council. Um, I would point to, for example, the placing of the yellow signs in an empty lot. I drove by there the other day. You cannot see it from Stern. You cannot see it from Bounce. We have the ability to put a QR code on there to link them directly to the documents. We do not do that. Things like that we can change. We want to establish trust. I think that's where Chief Story has done a great job. He's been able to build trust by communication. So I think we can do that going forward, and I look forward to working with constituents and my colleagues on council and with the city manager. Thank you. Councilor Mitchis. No comments. Councilor Graham. Yeah, just two quick things. Uh, thinking about zoning writ large, not talking about anything specific coming up, um, I don't think I have faced a single zoning change that didn't come with pushback. Um, people just dislike change. And I think good food for thought is that if you live in a subdivision, or particularly if you live in a planned community, when that was being brought forward, there were people who were railing against the neighborhood that you now value, that you cherish, that you want to protect. Um, so, yeah, just, just food for thought. And second, um, just wanna say, Akani, how very excited I am to be able to continue working with you. Um, I wanna thank you for choosing to remain here, to continue to bring your gifts and your heart and your cariño to the council and to the city. And, uh, you know, and also thank you to your family for hopefully enjoying being Las Cruces for some more time. So, thank you. Thank you. Um, I'll have a, I have a few quick notes. The Las Cruces for Palestine have presented a resolution and I do ask that we bring it forward um, to council and um, consider it uh, as part of our, our duty to our community and the things that were presented today. So I hope that um, we can consider that as a future action. The, the next item is related to, I wanna congratulate my friend and colleague Monica Torres for becoming the president, which of NMSU and, and uh, the NMSU system. I'm really excited for her to be at the helm um, as, a, as a human being. I've worked with her for, for my entire time in Las Cruces in some capacity or another. I consider her um, a pretty extraordinary leader and I think we're at a moment, I'm, I'm really proud uh, to be at this moment to see Monica at the helm of NMSU and Ikani here in the city to see, to see us moving forward in ways that I think are really extraordinary and I, I love the opportunity that um, the future holds for us. So I'm, I'm super optimistic um, in that way and a lead, a sp inspiring leaders all around, I would say. Um, and I also just wanna follow up on the question of zoning. I think um, uh, fundamentally, I think 
we, in a lot of ways, our zoning, our approach to zoning has led to our housing crisis. It's been a significant factor across the country to contributing to, to housing crises. Um, and I think that we owe it to our community to reform that process and, and stop um, sort of putting limits on things that, that result in fewer housing units available at all price points for folks in our community. And so I think that's why I'm really glad that Realize is, is up and available and it is uh, aiming to, to shift that, uh, what I would consider sort of um, a, a significant contributing factor to our existing housing crisis. And so I, I'm really also hopeful about the changes that we might be making, but I do, um, urge my colleagues to read about some of the, some folks alluded to what has changed between 2020 and, and now. Um, and there's a lot of research now that shows the ways that zoning contributes to, to housing insecurity in our communities and in our cities. And I think that that research um, would, would be really well served by um, us considering it while we consider our zoning reforms generally. Um, again, not related to anything that we were talking about today, except folks mentioned what's changed. And, and I think the access to information about this um, is different now. So uh, those, are, those are my main comments. Thanks. Sorry, Councilor Flores. Thank you, Mr. Mr. Mayor. And um, so I have a few things to share. Uh, first of all, Las Cruces seeks comments for major codes and zoning changes. So for those of you who are here and for those of you who are on Channel 22 or maybe our media, I would ask uh, of Mr. Garcia to publicize this. I saw this in the bulletin, in Friday's bulletin, um, March 22, announcing that um, the city of Las Cruces is seeking public input for a draft of Realize Las Cruces, a massive overhaul of zoning and codes that govern how, when, and where different types of buildings can be erected. Comment period, which opened March 13, 2024, and lasts until April 5, which is this Friday, 2024, is meant to gather public input about the real, realized Las Cruces draft. So this specifically involves land development codes related to historic preservation, zoning regulations, subdivision regulations, development standards, roadways, transportation analysis, parking, drainage, and stormwater. So if any of you want to learn more about this, uh, you can contact David Weir, uh, Deputy Director of Community Development. However, uh, this does not give his email address. Uh, you can call him. Um, you can get his email address on our website. I don't, I don't know what his, it might be dweir at lascruces.gov. Is that what it would be? And well, it's just, you know, people have whatever. Anyway, D as in David. Uh, we're w e i r at lascruces.gov. Um, <clears throat> that's correct. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I just I want to share with you um, a little bit about uh, Cesar Chavez. Yesterday was his birthday. He was born on March 31 in 1927, and he died on um, was it April? Well, he died in 1997. I should remember I was there. Um, he served in the US Navy, and he um, organized the Farm Workers of America. And then it became the United Farm Workers after it joined the AFL-CIO. The AFL, the American Federation of Labor, CIO, Congress of uh, Industrial Organizations were formed, that was formed back in the late 40s, I believe, or maybe early, anyway, it was formed. Ironically, uh, they did not want, uh, especially the AFL, didn't want the, the, uh, the farm workers union to be a part of it because, you know, they were AFL 
And, um, you know, so uh, eventually, back in 65, I believe it was then that, uh, it was 1964, the Bracero program ended. And what happened was that the, the government would allow, um, really, almost like indentured, indentured, indentured servants to come from um, primarily Mexico to uh, work the fields and, you know, throughout the United States but I'm focusing primarily in California because um, of all the, you know, all the, it's a big state and uh, there's just a lot of growth of a lot of things, almonds, oranges, uh, grapes, and um, uh, lettuce and other stuff. At any rate, um, so then um, that was when things started to move, but they never were able to really form a union until, or excuse me, yeah, to uh, join uh, a force. And uh, under the direction of Saul Alinsky, who started the community uh, services organization, who trained Fred Ross in Chicago, and his son, Fred Ross Jr., was the one that worked directly with Dolores Huerta and, and Cesar Chavez. So, um, they finally, uh, once they were accepted to the AFL-CIO, they still didn't have any way to have arbitration about their collective bargaining agreement. They didn't have any way of really, they didn't have the uh, standing to actually join a union, to join it. So they uh, created in 1975 under uh, Governor Jerry Brown in California, they were able to have the Agricultural Labor Relations Board and uh, it was that, that that allowed them to have a collective, to join a union, form a union, and um, have a collective bargaining agreement. I think that a lot of people think that, um, well, anyway, he, um, the, the upshot of all of this is that he gave a lot of, um, he gave a lot of uh, dignity to, to the worker, to the agricultural worker. And I had the, um, I had the privilege, this is very near and dear to me, because I, I walked the picket lines for him when I was in law school. Um, the law school I went to is uh, in the Tenderloin in San Francisco, and we'd go into the, uh, all the, all the, it was a reason, there's a reason it was a Tenderloin. Everything has been kind of cleaned up now, but this was back in the 70s. And um, there was just, uh, you know, just tons of little, liquor stores, and we were able to get Gallo wine off of there because Julio and Cesar, Julio and, and Ernesto Gallo are the biggest, have the biggest vineyards. And um, at any rate, even at gunpoint, we were able to take the Gallo off the shelves. We were able to have the bigger stores pool their green grapes and uh, iceberg lettuce off their shelves. So um, it's very near and dear to me, and my then husband and my older son were actually um, were actually pallbearers at his funeral. The Kennedys were there, especially she and uh, uh, Robert Kennedy's family. Um, and so I just wanted to share that. And all this came to mind um, yesterday was his birthday, and I think one year there was a proclamation for Cesar. But you know, I just thought about him, and he died uh, relatively young, because he would—he really was a believer in uh, Gandhi and, and peace and doing and, and fasting. So he really wore out his little body, and uh, he just you know up and died. Fortunately, Dolores Huerta continues uh, with uh, her program in San Bernardino County. Anyway, and uh, back to the mundane. Um, the SERTD is expanding routes. Um, they're incorporating Hatch, and then they're trying to get buses to, you know, throughout the different counties um, that SERTD serves. Um, and um, the, uh, perspec the perspective um, uh, money that's coming in is we're getting more and more federal money. Um, the electric buses uh, are in line to be rolled out. And um, the other, I would like to, um, I'd like to follow up on what Counselor, uh, what Counselor uh, McClure just brought up. 
Those yellow signs, I mean, I don't know, I don't know what you have to say, because I have been talking about that for, I've been on council, this is my seventh year, and, and there's so much development in the East Mesa, and I brought this up to, because it was the same problem. People just happened to run into a sign that had just flown off because it's so, they're so small and they're placed in these weird areas. And, and the, the irony, though, is that they want community input or notice or whatever. And so I don't know what the city's going to do about that. All I know is that it's, they've got to do something. Um, the city art board is going to, it'll be its second annual Chalk the Plaza and that is part, I think it's called Mira Las Cruces, if I recall correctly. Yes, because you're definitely, yes, thank you, Ricani. And is it April 24th, it's Saturday, April 24th, or the 27th? Yeah, okay. So it's Saturday, um, April 27th. And I want to encourage all of our artists to participate because last year's was absolutely fantastic. I, not only on, well, participate with the, chalk thing, so they, they're calling on artists, and the theme is, um, this is Las Cruces, oh my God, I'm so sorry, but, um, so a postcard, it's the, the name, the theme is Postcard from Las Cruces, which means that the artist has to draw something in chalk that is exclusively Las Cruces, not a self-portrait, not anything else but that. So um, anyway, um, there's a lot of other stuff, but I've talked enough. Thank you. Mayor Pro Tem. Mayor, I want to just jump back in for one quick second and um, yes, go ahead. Add my add my voice to Councillor Corrin's. Uh, I would also support seeing the resolution mentioned during public comment today for Las Cruces for Gaza or for Palestine. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you both. Um, thank you, all of you. <laughs> I, do, I have a little bit of a list, but I'm going to try to get through it pretty quickly. I do just want to note that April 11th is the 56th anniversary of the Fair Housing Act that made discrimination in housing transactions unlawful. And I think um, we have still a long, long way to go towards equity and justice in housing policy, the way we invest in housing, the way we build it, the way we rent it, all of that. So um, I did just want to note that um, that is April. It marks the 56th anniversary of the Fair Housing Act. Um, I would also like to have us um, discuss and vote on a ceasefire resolution. Um, I think a lot of people might say, well, don't you have better things to do? But I, my answer to that would be th there's always time to do the right thing. And I would personally like to be on the right side of history. And um, even if we thought, well, that sounds like a really scary thing to do um, when there's so many other things happening. Um, but we can be expansive enough to hold many truths at once. And I will also say that we wouldn't be alone. Um, there's been over 70 cities who have already um, stood on the right side of history, and I think Las Cruces has never been afraid to do so, and I would like to see us do that um, and follow the lead of so many community members who are organizing and who understand the deep intersection of that work. I wanted to remind people about my District 4 open houses. Um, the first one is tomorrow at 4.30 p.m. at the WIA building um, near Pioneer Park. And it's from 4.30 to 6.30. There'll be multiple depart departments there that you can speak with. It's open house style, so you can come in at any time between those two times. There's no formal agenda, um, but you can talk to myself, to constituent services, to any department, uh, the departments that we've chosen to be there, which are, you know, the high, frequently talked about departments anyway. Um, and then the second opportunity you have, it'll be the exact same format, so if you come to one, you won't miss anything on the second one, but if you can't make it tomorrow, April 9th is the second one at 4.30 p.m., same time, 4.30 to 6.30 at Picacho Middle School. Um, so I look forward to seeing many folks there and talking to a lot of people. Our new city manager will be there as well if you want to come talk to him, shake his hand, ask him how to pronounce his last name so that you can get it right. <laughs> it's very important. 
Um, and then I will also just say to my colleagues before I speak on municipal court real quick that for my colleagues and members of the council that if there is something you don't like, the best way to change it is to propose something new. And we can stay mad, we can stay mad that it's one way and that it's been one way for a long time. Or you can be mad, acknowledge it, and then say this is, this is a different way. I think we should do it. Um, and case in point, one of those pieces was municipal court. I was always had a lot of concerns about the way we um, appointed a second municipal judge, and I brought that forward. And um, Ifo, in his infinite wisdom before he left, made sure that uh, process was moving forward. And last week, I'm happy to report that Mayor Enriquez and I met with um, JC from HR, our city clerk, and Judge Filosa and his court uh, manager, Melissa. Shoot, I forget her last name. Melissa Caldwell. Caldwell. Thank you so much. Um, and we are moving forward with appointing a judge number two. That is the responsibility of the mayor and city council. So we will be uh, moving that process forward. Seven people applied to be judge number two. I think that speaks highly to um, Judge Filosa and his credibility in this community and that people really want to work with him in addition to many, many um, uh, court clerks applied as well, and they only had six positions open, but many people applied. And for the case manager position at municipal court, about 20 people applied. And of course, there's only one position, and I, I think that speaks highly to the investment that we're making in municipal court, but also that people, I think, really want to work with someone like Judge Filosa. And I'm excited to move that forward because I think municipal court is a critical piece of the puzzle when we're talking about community safety and um, adequate and meaningful interventions for community members who are struggling. So very excited about that. Um, and then I do want to just, I think there's some misconception about um, lobbying and Santa Fe for the city. Do I think there could be improvements? Yeah, absolutely. I think there's always room for improvement um, and for a better way for us to do uh, Santa Fe as a team. But we have a lobbyist um, Larry Horan, who is frankly an incredible advocate for the city. When, when we have a vote on the pieces on capital outlay projects that we want to put forth, and re in past years we've also done resolutions on specific policies that we want to support. Larry is an incredible advocate for the city. The times that I have been to Santa Fe, and don't get me wrong, you know, we're not just like going to Santa Fe flailing around hoping to get attention. Though that's what it feels like when you're in Santa Fe in the roundhouse. That's certainly what I feel like in this like circle of death almost. Um, but I do, every time I've gone with Larry, I notice that everybody in that building knows him. Like he has got an incredible reputation and I think he is a great advocate for Las Cruces. But I do think that we need to start our um, efforts much faster, much sooner than November, December, perhaps in the summertime. Um, so I do think there's room, significant room for improvement. Um, let me mark off my pieces. And then I just do want to congratulate Ikani once again, and of course every single person who applied and the people who we um, interviewed, and I just have so much love and respect for um, the public servants of the city. And I've said this many times, up, us up here, we come and go. And you, many of you have committed your life's work to public service and to this beautiful city and to helping it make it better and grow faster and stronger. And um, I have just the utmost admiration for every single one of you for the dedication. Um, that you have for our city. So I really want to thank all of you in the audience and you know who you are and I just, I'm always so impressed. And I did get a lot of feedback about um, how, pe how excited people are about Ikani. Ikani, you've made an incredible impression in your short time here um, and people like you very much. But I also got a lot of feedback about how brave it was that we went internal. Um, I don't know that I felt brave doing it. To me, it was like, yeah, duh, that's right. Four years ago, that wasn't, you know, we weren't there, and this year it felt that was right. And um, I couldn't be more grateful for, for the outcome and just to be exposed to the talent and wisdom that we have in this city. 
Um, and then, of course, Ifo might not be turning it, tuning in. Or maybe he is, I don't know. Uh, maybe he's bored in West Valley and he's tuning in. Um, so I, <laughs> if he is, and I will also just, his, last, his official last day was yesterday, and I just want to publicly name how much Ifo Pili meant to me as a counselor, to the city, how, um, how much of a strong, he was such a strong city manager, and um, he made a significant impact, and I, of course, told him privately um, a goodbye, but I just wanted to officially say that on the dais as well. And that will be it for me today, Mayor. Thank you. Yeah, yes, go ahead. No, not half an hour. Just half an hour. Timer's on. <laughs> okay. I, I was remiss. Thank you, Ikani, for accepting the offer. Or have you accepted? I hope so. Or oh, you have until. Voted on okay. Today. I hope. No. Well, yeah. Oh, oh okay. So thank you for accepting the offer. Congratulations. It was difficult, but we made the right decision. Thank you, Connie. And I just want to thank you so much for your commitment to our, the growth of our city. And the airport especially is you know, so important. Everything. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. OK, thank you. Um, just want to do a couple of invites for the public. Uh, as Mayor Pro Tem stated, we're, we're talking about municipal court. On April 22nd, there'll be a work session. It'll be uh, addressing some of those issues. Uh, it's a budget work session, but please come so you can see what we're looking at doing to, to improve the safety in our community and addressing a lot of the comments the public comes with. So that'll be April 22nd, there'll be a work session. And then also on April 4th, that's this Thursday, at 6 p.m. at the downtown plaza, there'll, there'll be a group of faith-based uh, organization that has come forward and inviting the public to do a blessing for the brave. So it'll be a blessing uh, at 6 p.m. for our, our first responders in this community. So please join us if you can. And then lastly, I just also want to say congratulations to Ikani. Um, I look forward to working with you, and I know you'll do great things for our city. Thank you. And I'll turn it over to you now. Thank you, Mayor Enriquez, Mayor Potempa, and Como, and to all the city councilors. Again, thank you so much for your support. Just a few city uh, uh, city manager updates. I appreciate uh, Barbara sending uh, me just a reminder uh, to really thank our Neighborhood Leadership Academy. This is a program I believe was happening uh, during COVID or before COVID. Uh, it wasn't happening when I arrived here, and I remember it was being talked about coming back, and it was resurrected. So thank you so much to Katrina, to Grace, and to the whole team making that happen, and to all the residents sacrificing their nights uh, to be here. Uh, that's great. Great things to come from Katrina. Um, and uh, also another helpful reminder from Barbara that Larry Haran will be here next Monday to present on exactly that, um, on um, things uh, upcoming a report of what's happened with the legislative uh, update and then also a bit of the strategy um, uh, they'll share on um, it obviously getting your words of wisdom on on how to approach that but he'll have some uh, some golden nuggets on that to share this upcoming Monday uh, appreciate from Sonia um, there was a public comment uh, David Rutherford who was uh, concerned about the the waters potentially um, running out. I appreciate Adrian. Adrian has the contact information. She's on it. She'll reach out um, and, and let the gentleman know that we're fine. So thank you. Thank you, Adrian. And also in very good hands. I yes. really, I always, sorry, Connie, I just always want to shout out Adrian, our utilities director, because she is a literal water expert. And so we are in very good hands. She's an expert too. Yes, we are. Thank you, Adrian. Appreciate that. Uh, additionally, there was a public comment on lighting situation for the Mesquite Neighborhood Group uh, that was mentioned by Israel. Just wanted to let you know that Public Works, uh, they do understand what's happening. They'll shoot a uh, report and we'll get that over to you. You know what's happening there. There is um, Councillor 
Flores mentioned Mira Las Cruces. I just have to uh, share a little bit more about that because uh, Visit Las Cruces would kill me if I didn't. Just a reminder, the second annual Mira Las Cruces Fest will be held on Saturday, April 27th at Plaza de Las Cruces, highlighting the tourism attraction and events of our city. This year, the event has added exciting new elements, including an expanded farmer's market experience. Luchadores. Lucha Libre will be there in the food truck, fiesta, I, yes. Lucha Libre and Luchadores will be there. Uh, you heard right. Uh, they'll be there in the truck, truck, fiesta area, and radio control. Also, hot air balloons will be there, in effect. You heard correct, yes, hot air balloons, with the unveiling of the Visit Las Cruces Mira Balloon. Also, you can get ready for the event with Baila Las Cruces on Thursday, the Thursday before that Saturday, before with free dance lessons from Seoul Ballroom. The monthly event on the plaza will concentrate of popular borderland dances like salsa, cumbia, merengue, bachata, norteño, quebradita, lo que, lo que quieres estar allá. Um, so seriously, come out. That was uh, really a brainchild of, of, of staff and Visit Las Cruces to come up and invite the community for some hate culture uh, happening. If um, that's it from Visit Las Cruces, uh, quality of life. Las Cruces Public Libraries hosted a few charrettes last week. The primary purpose of this meeting was to look at the Brannigan Library and determine the best way to renovate and expand. Last week, the consultant shared some rough sketches from the li Library Advisory Board. This is still a work in progress and more to come. And, and uh, I, I would be remiss if I didn't share um, echoing what Mayor Pertem Mencomo and the counselors feel. Um, I, I want to thank all, all of my associates uh, who, who also applied for this position. Um, you counselors, uh, Mayor and Mayor Pro Tem would have been in fine hands with any of those candidates. I strongly believe that, and I would have gladly supported um, any of them. Um, it is, it is a, the goal, um, one of my goals as I'm here to, when the time comes up um, for the, the next person to take the seat, that the decision to go internal, there will be so many qualified that you have, um, you have the momentum to continue to go internal because we have a lot of qualified internal candidates. So thank you to all the candidates and to my, my associates who all applied. It takes courage to put yourself out there. Uh, so thank you so much for, for putting in submitting. Um, it's not easy, there's a lot of work, um, there's a lot of preparation, but thank you also to, the, uh, to my associates who uh, uh, made it to the interview as well. Again, uh, this, the staff does all the heavy lifting, um, and so I appreciate, I can't do this job without them. Thank you, Councilors, Mayor. All right, thank you. I guess we're looking for adjournment. Move to adjourn. Second, Graham. This is on the motion to adjourn the meeting. Councilor McClure? Yes. Councilor Matisse? Yes. Councilor Graham? Yes. Councilor Cran? Yes. Councilor Flores? No, no. Yes. <laughs> Councilor Bencomo? Yes. And Mayor.